Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the committee's 18th meeting in 2019. Could I ask everyone please to make sure your mobile phones are on silent? Uh, we have apologies from uh, the deputy convener, Gail Ross, who uh, unfortunately is not well this morning. And I'd like to welcome Pauline McNeil to the, to the committee. Welcome. The first item on the agenda is to continue taking evidence on the policy intentions of Stage 2 amendments to the Transport Bill on the proposed working place parking levy. We have two panels giving evidence today, and I'd like to welcome the first panel, which will focus the levy's impact, potential impact on employers, employees and workplaces. First of all, I'd like to welcome uh, yeah, just Alistair Brown, the National Director of the Scottish Association of Social Work. Fiona Beale, the Head of Corporate Real Estate for Aviva. Um, David Lonsdale, the Director of Scottish Retail Consortium. Colin Smith, the Chief Executive for the Scottish Wholesale Association. Helen Martin, the Assistant General Secretary for the Scottish Trade Unions Congress. And David Belsey, the Assistant Secretary for Educational Institute of Scotland. Um, what I would say to you is uh, it's a big panel today and I'd like everyone to have the opportunity to contribute. So it, members will pose questions to you and we'll ask you to answer them. If you could keep your eyes on me occasionally, it means that I don't have to signal the gentleman on your left to cut off the microphones because you're going on too far. Um, so if you just keep an eye on me, I'll try and keep you right. And, and if I'm going like that, that means that uh, we're, we're coming... I've got Stuart. Um, uh, we're coming to the end of the bit that you'd like, and I'd like to give somebody else a chance to come in. If I feel anyone's not coming in enough, I'll try and bring them in as well, just so you will get the opportunity. You don't need to touch the consoles in, your, on, in front of you. They will all be operated from your left. So when somebody, when it's seen you're going to speak, they, they, they will bring you in. Uh, I would like just to make sure if there's any declarations of interest before I go. Richard, you'd like to go with one? Yes, can I point out? I actually receive a small pension from Aviva, who, who took over a pension uh, that I had. Thank you. And Stuart? Um, I have a small investment and assurance vehicle with Aviva. OK, thank you. Uh, OK, so we have a series of questions, and the first one is from John Finney. John? It is. I beg your pardon. Right. Um, it's to the panel about uh, data and the proportion. Do any of you have any data in the proportion of employees that use on-site workplace car parks, please? You'd like to start off with that. that, that of course, the danger is if everyone looks away and, and no one's prepared to, to offer, I, I'll have to ask somebody to, to go. But uh, what, what, what about Fiona? Do you know how many people are, are parking and using your car parking spaces? Yes, I, I am happy to help you with that question. Um, across our two main Scottish hubs in Pitevlis in Perth and Bishop Briggs, we have 1,200 car parking spaces and that services staff numbers of 2,000. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else at all? No, no one else has data. Colin, do you... Do you do Unfortunately, I don't have uh, specific data relating to the number of spaces um, that our members have. Um, the Scottish Wholesale Association obviously represent the, uh, the wheels to the food and drink industry and, and given that our members are large warehouses and out-of-town locations, they also do have obviously large car parks um, for, not necessarily for the staff, but for, for the customers by nature of the, that business, our business. Our members come and collect goods um, from the wholesaler. Um, I would estimate, and it is purely an estimate, um, that certainly 80% of our staff um, commute um, by, by car to their place of work. But in terms of rigid data, unfortunately, I don't have that. I'm happy to go away and, and survey the members and get that information if you, if you would like. That would be very helpful. Thank yeah. you. If you could share it with the, the committee. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I mean, I'm just wondering, Alistair, you, you, you would have a lot of uh, members uh, of, of, or that you represent that, that would have to parking spaces at work? I mean, is it, is it nearly all of them or is it a proportion of them? 
We don't have specific numbers, but the vast majority of members are using their own cars, and obviously there are a lot of members for the 32 local authorities that are in rural areas, and as you'll see from our evidence, many of them are using their own cars as part of their day-to-day -day work. Yeah. I mean, that did, it struck me in the evidence, I think, that, that some people f were, were of the opinion that uh, the cars were, were seen as a safe place to, to, to visit as well for people that are meeting with your, your members. I think that's absolutely correct. People are constantly doing very kind of taxing emotional work in a, an increasingly difficult and less resourced environment and feeling under tremendous pressure and um, having to respond to things very, very quickly. John. Thank you, that's very helpful. I was going to ask Mr Brown, I wonder what your view is on the public sector relying on an employee to own a private motor vehicle in order to discharge their duties. That's surely a barrier to someone, for instance, accessing a post in the first place. Should you not uh, be pushing for employers to be providing vehicles, a pooled system among local authorities? I mean, I think that that's some of the more strategic issues that definitely need looked at in terms of social work posts that I've held. Mainly, there's been one pool car per team. Um, and that's generally largely insufficient. And, and in terms of providing statutory roles, in terms of adult child protection and, um, and mental health statutory tasks, um, you, you know, you need to respond very quickly. And sometimes you need to go out to a client three, four times within a day. So it's not all scheduled carefully. No, I understand that. And perhaps I should declare that my wife is a former uh, uh, social worker who okay. used her, her, her vehicle in that way. But the, the principle the principle of an expectation that an employee provides their employer, a local authority, with a private motor vehicle for the public use. Do you think that's a tenable situation going forward? Um, I'm very happy to, to answer that question. I, I, I fear, John, that may be going uh, beyond the amendment that you, you, you've submitted uh, to the Transport Bill. But, Helen, do you want to make a brief comment on that and then perhaps we can move on to, to John's question? Um, well, I would just agree. I, th I think the treatment of, of staff in this area needs, needs to be looked at in social work as a whole. And I would recommend that the Committee of the Fair Work Convention report on um, social work workers as a very good uh, reflection of some of the fair work issues in that sector. Okay. Th thank you. Well, and, and thank you also for all your evidence. C can I ask <coughs> what your expectations are about where this levy may be imposed? Do you think it will apply to? We're hearing that it's intended to be imposed, particularly in cities in the uh, Dundee, Edinburgh and Glasgow are actively looking at it. And I think whilst we've said in our evidence, we appreciate there are difficult issues to balance in terms of disproportionate effect on the poor of uh, pollution, that you know these are very difficult, a difficult balance. But until all these other structural things are achieved, then it, it seems to be impossible uh, to, to, to move ahead and just tax our members uh, a further £500 a year if VAT is increased Sorry, and added where, on. Where did you get the, that figure from? Well, so it's £415 mentioned in the papers and a VAT would be added in, in comparing to the Nottingham. There's, there's no figures established. This is simply an enabling piece of legislation to be for local authorities to determine. Okay, well, in terms of the, in terms of the Nottingham scheme that, that's been much talked about, it was talked about £415 plus VAT. Ms Beale, would you envisage it being applied in the, the two areas you referred to at all? We, we, we don't know. We have absolutely no idea. Um, I come here today to Mr Finney to say that actually Aviva, Aviva is supportive of a workplace transport levy if it reduces cars on the road. And I think it's, it would be important for those organisations who are already um, doing things in this area to have some sort of recognition. Whilst we do have some workplace car parking, uh, we also support car share schemes. We, uh, in, we've invested about 1.7 million over the last eight years in bringing um, additional bus uh, access to our sites. We support cycling to work. Uh, and, then, and we provide loans to, uh, for season tickets. So what I'm looking for is recognition of what organisations are already doing and where they're already doing something, there should potentially be some exemptions. John, that sort of neatly brings us on yes, to the yes, next question, which is from, from John Mason. John. 
Uh, thanks, Convener, and yes, uh, probably Aviva are the ones I'm interested in speaking to as well, because I thought your paper was very helpful, so I appreciate uh, you sh sharing with us what you are actually doing already. The, the question I'm interested in is uh, the, the fact that in some areas there is good public transport and some areas uh, there isn't, and that obviously makes a difference. Now, I suppose in the first question then, presumably the local authority knows if there's good public transport to your sites or anyone else's sites, so it would be quite good if we let the local authority decide if they want to introduce this or not. I mean, for example, you say that uh, Bishop Briggs... Um, you know, you've been encouraging people to use the bus and so on, and I, I think there's a bus that passes your site every 15 minutes, so that strikes me as a good bus service. Um, why do you think uh, that's not appropriate for more of your workers to use the bus? So, specifically for Bishop Briggs, we um, bring in a number of services to our site, and we invest circa £150,000 a year in doing that. Many people who work in our Bishop Riggs operation live in quite rural areas that are not well served by public transport. And I think that it's important that local authorities give consideration to this. The Nottingham case that's been well publicised is, is a city centre. And a lot of um, our two main sites are edge of town and not well served by public transport, which is why Aviva has to supplement that. So, so you said that local authorities, I think you said local authorities should take that into account. That would suggest that we should pass the bill, give local authorities the power, and then they make the real decision. Is, is that what you would feel? Uh, Aviva, Aviva's view is that actually organisations that are already um, supporting cars being removed off the road um, should get some recognition. Right. And our view is that actually any exemptions and recognition should be done at a national level. Um, I suppose as, a, as an organisation, we wouldn't want to deal with multiple local authorities. We would expect it to be set at a national level. OK, thanks. Would, would anyone else like to comment on that area, Mr Smith? Yeah, if I may add, um, going back to my original point, uh, we, our members are based on out-of-town um, industrial estates across the country, so from as high up as islands and the Highlands and Islands down to Edinburgh, Glasgow and the borders. Um, purely the fact that they are, we are based on these industrial estates, transport links are poor at the best of times. Um, but equally, 92% of our members that we surveyed um, have a workforce that's on, on, on shift work. Um, we are a 24-7 business. Um, you know, we're open during the day, um, but equally we're, we're trunking food and drink out across the country in the evenings. Um, and our workforce is, is reliant on their car to get to those out-of-town locations. There isn't public transport necessarily during the day that goes to those, and especially not at 10 o'clock at night when they're going into their work or 5 o'clock in the morning when they're leaving which also brings me on to the, the fact that one of our points and concerns about this is also the safety of our workforce going into their work at 10 o'clock in the morning, potentially having to um, park on the streets of the industrial estate because they can't afford to pay the workplace parking levy and so decide um, that they would park on the street, which might be hundreds of metres um, away from their, the safety of the place of work where there is CCTV, security guards and such like. Um, so, while we would like to see a reduction in car use, and certainly our members are already taking proactive approach to make their business more environmentally friendly, investing um, in green fleet technology to, to improve driver efficiency and encouraging staff, where possible, maybe to use alternative modes of transport. I think the fact is that um, th th there still isn't those transport links to, to the out-of-town uh, industrial states. John. Uh, can I, can yeah, I bring yes, in okay, a couple yes, sure. of other members yeah, of the yeah, panel? Yeah. I, I noticed <coughs> uh, David Belsey and, and uh, maybe Helen could come in as well and, and David Lonsdale, sorry, uh, just to bring you all in, if I may. David, do you want to start off? Yeah, I think in, in terms of um, John Mason's question, I think the, the problem of giving local authorities the option to introduce the workplace levy and, and just push the problem to them would create a situation where there are thousands of workers who potentially, uh, and, and through no fault of their own, find themselves uh, disadvantaged in financial terms 
uh, in, a, um, in a flat rate tax uh, being applied to their workplace that will, um, evidence shows from Nottingham, be transferred to a large number of workers. And it, and it also, um, many workers, particularly in the, the outer town or, or rural places, or even in some parts of, of our larger cities, don't have the, the public transport options to get to their work timelessly to begin the day. And by an opening that uh, set of scenarios and simply giving the, 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 the sort of responsibility to local authorities is um, problematic. Helen, would you like to, to come in on that? Uh, yeah, I think we, we agree with that. We would... Um we, we think that uh, we aren't in favour of the, the amendment, um, primarily because it will potentially fall quite heavily on low paid workers. And um, we also believe that it doesn't fit well with other um, elements of the transport bill as currently constructed. So um, we were disappointed uh, about um, the proposals in the transport bill around bus travel in particular and about the fact that um, the, the transport bill only allows um, for the local authorities to be an operator of last resort. I think while that issue is still within the transport bill, introducing a workplace parking levy um, c would create, would combi combine difficult issues, I think, in terms of um, public transport. And uh, for us, we simply see this as a very small, limited proposal that is likely to place hardship on low-paid workers in particular and is not likely to raise the sort of money that is needed to be seen to really invest and transform the public transport um, arrangements. And with the provisions uh, preventing public ownership, we think that it, it simply won't achieve what I think um, Mr Finney would like it to achieve and therefore um, isn't something that we should do without a much broader strategy around it because of the hardship that will place on workers. Okay, thanks. John, you come back and then David. Come back and there's various points come in there. I mean, one is an absolute get it that, that where city and rural are different. Biggest problem, as far as I'm concerned, is in the cities and also Glasgow has a fabulous public transport system, so it shouldn't be such a, a problem. So, I mean... Mr Smith and Mr Belsley, I mean, have, have any of the rural local authorities said to you that they plan to introduce this? It, because it seems to me that by passing this amendment, we are giving the powers to the authorities. Probably the rural ones won't use it. Probably the city ones will at least think about it. And, and that would solve the problem. And to Miss Martin, surely it's the, in the centre of Glasgow, it's not the poorer workers that are taking their cars in. It's the, it's the rich directors. Are you defending them? Well, I think that's a... That's a very simplistic argument, really. I think a whole range of workers take their car to work for a whole range of reasons, um, particularly shift workers. And it is not true to say that public transport in the centre of Glasgow is perfect. Far from it. It's perfect at some times of day. If you work nine to five and you're a wealthy director, it probably is quite good. If you're working shift work or in hospitality where you're getting turfed out of your workplace at 2 a.m. We're running safe home campaigns constantly with hospitality workers because they aren't, there is no public transport and they're getting attacked on the way home um, because they can't afford to take a taxi because their wages are so low. And do they, so, sorry, do they take their cars in at the moment to the city centre? Well, some, some people do, some people don't. I mean, the ones who don't are getting attacked on their way home. So you're potentially putting more people into that category with this, with this amendment. And that's what we're concerned about. I think, you know, I, I absolutely appreciate the desire to do something about modal change. But I'm not sure that this is the tool in and of itself to do that. Can we bring in David Lonsdale and then somebody that, that, that sort of sparked everyone on the committee with questions. So bring in David and then I'll go to Jamie, uh, Stuart Stevenson <coughs> and John Finney. Uh, so David Lonsdale first. <coughs> Thank you, convener. I think, um, I think John Finney's uh, policy and, um, narrative and amendments are admirably clear. This is, a, first of all, a tax on premises. Um, and as you'll have gathered from our uh, submission, um, uh, the industry uh, feels it's had quite a lot of uh, taxes and costs on business. Uh, business uh, property costs are the second biggest outgoing after um, employment costs. Obviously, uh, anyone who's uh, had the pleasure of, uh, of me in front of their committee before talking about things like business rates will know some of our uh, points on that, and that's articulated in our submissions. So um, the poundage rate or the tax rate on business rates have got, has gone up markedly 
since the start of this decade. We now have a, a tax on business rates at a 20-year high. For retailers alone, our business rates bills went up £13 million last month. So we very much look at it from the prism of uh, this is going to be an additional cost on business. I think the points that have been made earlier on about whether or not that's been passed on to staff is a good one. Uh, the evidence is mixed. Uh, we can pro probably come on to that uh, later on. But the first and foremost, this is a, it's a cost to business. We're already paying business rates on parking spaces as well. Uh, and as you've seen from some of the data in terms of retail sales, uh, shop prices out today, this is a tough time for the industry uh, and very difficult to absorb a lot of these costs. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, do you want to ask your question? And, and I noticed one or two panel members wanting to come in, so I'll try and bring you in at the break for a moment. Jamie. So, thank you, Convener. <clears throat> and good morning, panel. There, there's so many different areas being covered, uh, but I'll try and focus on one area, and that's that given that when we discussed this with Nottingham uh, City Council last week, um, when pressed upon uh, what the main purpose of the parking levy was, it seemed to appear that it was primarily used to be raising uh, funds to improve uh, public transport in the city and that any secondary objectives to reduce congestion or improve air quality were secondary. Is there then a worry that if the power is given to all local authorities, it may be used by those local authorities in non-city areas simply as a mechanism for raising money uh, to invest in capital infrastructure projects rather than to actually tackle congestion in our cities? Helen, you, you, you're nodding furiously, so off you go. Yeah, I think, I think that is actually our concern. Um, and it's about the context upon which we are doing, we are putting this amendment into the transport bill. Local authority budgets have been very, very stretched in recent years. And I would actually go further than um, what, what, as you just described it, and say that local authorities will raise the levy to replace money that is currently going into transport um, so that they free up funds for other areas. I would imagine that there would be local authorities who are tempted to do that because such is the um, stretch on local government finance, that this is a way of simply um, funding essential services. And I would have sympathy for a local authority who found themselves in that position, but I do think that it's potentially quite damaging for low-paid workers who are, who are in that position and who are not seeing an improvement in their, in their public transport as a result. David Belsey, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I think this also comes back to John Mason's point earlier. He was saying that uh, rural local authorities probably won't introduce this, but the reality is that because it is a means of raising revenue at a time when um, it's generally acknowledged that councils are stretched, then they will be tempted to implement them. And uh, it raises a relatively small amount of money for within uh, Nottingham. And uh, if a local authority has uh, implements its own scheme, with its own exemptions, and I appreciate that. But some workers will be paying into something uh, and seeing the, um, the, the small revenues raised spent elsewhere and not affecting their own commuting or um, uh, travel habits at all. And that is a worry. Stuart, do you want to come in on um, David Lawton still correctly identified that there's a physical infrastructure when an employer provides a, a workplace to provide it and that it attracts business rate liability, potentially. Uh, this is a further cost associated with provision of parking. Can anyone on the panel tell me of any substantial employer who currently passes on the cost of providing parking to cover physical provision and business rates onto employees? And if not, why would the workplace parking levy, which is a levy on the provider of the parking, not on individuals, why would it be passed on to individuals when the previous costs are not? Who would like to... Alistair, you'd like to head off on that, and then probably Colin. So, I, uh, the City of Edinburgh Council passes that cost on to employees already for, for um, key locations, particularly city centre locations. Colin, did you want to...? I've maybe picked you up wrong, but the... The business rates um, that our members are already paying between £130,000 a year up to half a million pounds a year. Um, that's excluding the large business supplement that a lot of them will fall under. We're, the business is already paying a tax on that work, workplace, that parking space, um, and that's not passed on, obviously, to the, to the employee. 
Um, if, if the work given it, you yes. say obviously not passed on to the employee, would it not also be obvious that you would not pass the workplace parking mm, levy well, on to the employee? It's, it's kind of really the question, you know, no, where's the, the philosophical reason the, why the, suddenly we're talking about employees paying? Because the business rates is a cost to run your business, it's, that's, that's a given and that's absorbed as, as a part of your business cost, as workplace parking levy. Um, is over, over and above that, so this is an additional cost that mm -hmm. um, shouldn't. Well, my members, 93, uh, sorry, 82 percent of my members surveyed will be passing this on to their employees because they can't afford this. That said, however, and I would need to go back to the members and ask: Should business rates be reduced as a result of the workplace parking levy and not being double taxed? Then they would look to potentially absorb the WPL. Right. Sorry. Can I just clarify something? Just. I, I may have got this wrong, but when you're assessed for business rates, it's on the rental value of the property uh, that it could achieve on the open market, and, and that sets the, the value of the property, and then the business rates is, is raised on a percentage of that value. So if you didn't own your property and you got hit by a working place parking levy, surely you would go back to your landlord and say, we are paying an additional tax, therefore we want a reduction in the rent that we're paying. That would be the first thing I would do. Uh, do, do you th does anyone see the logic behind that? Or, I mean, Aviva, you, you, you probably own your, uh, Fiona, your company owns the buildings, do they? No, we, we, the, predominantly we are renters. So would you, would you, would you see a, an opportunity to reduce the rental value we, of the building? We honestly haven't given that any consideration yet as to whether we would appeal our rates if it was introduced. OK. Uh, well, perhaps... Uh, uh, as a surveyor, that somebody might see the opportunities there. David, and then come to John thank, Finney. Thank you, convener. I think, um, I think uh, Stuart Stevenson picks up on, on a good point. And obviously, from our perspective, it's too early to say that um, if this legislation is passed and if these levies come into effect, whether or not uh, employers in our industry would look to, to pass on some of the costs. There may be other options. So, for example, uh, Fiona talked about some of the support that her company gives to staff to encourage them to use public transport, whether that's season ticket loans, uh, providing buses, um, you know, cycle to work facilities and schemes like that. One option might be actually to cannibalise that budget in order to pay for the levy. Uh, so that might be an option. But as I say, it's too early to, to pass it on, to, to consider what the detail is and whether it passes on. I think the other point I would probably just want to, to make, obviously, if, uh, if this is brought in, if the industry, in our sector at least, we often, a number of our members often have multiple sites within a local authority area. Um, so that could actually potentially increase the bill. What would then happen in that case? Obviously, it's yet to be determined, but their bill could be quite large for the levy as well. So there are some unintended consequences with bringing in the levy. We may see reductions, as I say, in areas that are supporting people to use public transport. John, you had a question you'd like to ask, and then we'll move on to Richard Lyle. Yeah, it, it was for Mr Lonsdale, and all our papers are readily available online, Mr Lonsdale, and people will note your written submission, which I stress is very helpful. And initially, you talk about the background to your organisation and you um, talk about the £180 billion of retail sales. And it is about Mr Stevenson's question about uh, philo philosophical approach to this. I mean, people don't like paying taxes, I get this, but this is just a line, the, the latest one on a number of things you're unhappy about, because you're unhappy about apprenticeship levy, you're unhappy about employer pension contributions and the statutory minimum wage. So this is just the latest whinge, really, isn't it? Uh, I think that's an unfair uh, characterisation uh, of, of our well, position. Well, can you confirm that you, you have in your written submission expressed concerns about each of these contributions you feel you have to make? The, the argument that we are making is this is an industry in some flux and some change. Um, there's obviously profound shifts in the way people are shopping. Uh, so shopping in stores, physical bricks and mortar stores, is declining. People are shopping increasingly online. At the same time, consumers have less money than they had before. And the third sort of strand really is that costs are rising. Many of the policies in our, that you've just mentioned, that were touched on in our submission, are ones we support. But the cumulative burden, the wave after wave of costs increasing without 
any sort of recognition of the economic impact it is quite incredible. And you're right to finger... You don't know the impact that this would have where it applied, and the likelihood is it's going to be applied perhaps to local authorities. Um, you well, we, you, we have you no haven't assessed the impact, but you're unhappy with what you say the impact's going to be. Well, I'd take your line of questioning. I, 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 I'd like David briefly to answer that, and then I'd like to move on to Richard, just purely because we are on yep. question no two, and, and, I, and I perceive there may be multiples of ten of that to get through in the time that we've got. So, David, if you'd like to briefly answer that, and then I'm going to move to Richard. Well, in terms of these other policies, um, you know, as I say, we've been supportive of a lot of these things. Often it's the, you know, they all come at once, and that's very, very challenging for employers, particularly in a tough, tough market conditions. The one thing in favour of a lot of these other policies is, frankly, there was some sort of economic assessment. Uh, in a Scottish context, we're talking about a, a business and regulatory uh, impact assessment. As far as I can see, there is nothing along those lines associated with this levy. Um, I have no idea where the Scottish Government's regulatory review group uh, have had a chance to consider this and input into it. So, I mean, it, it, I find it quite astonishing that we're actually talking about this, um, this levy without any sense whatsoever as to what the impact would be on consumers, on businesses, on local authorities. It's, it's, it's quite startling that we're doing policy making in this day and age in this way. We're very supportive of evidence-based policy making in the round. We work constructively with the Scottish Government and the UK Government on a whole host of issues. But I just, as I say, I find it astonishing that there's no impact assessment at all at this moment point. Sorry? John, in, sorry, in fairness, uh, I, I'm going to leave that question hanging because it's a question that's been answered before. And I did say that, 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 okay. that I would leave. Richard, I'm going to come to you because yours yes, is the next question. Yes, good uh, morning, panel. Can I say to Mr Lonsdale and anyone else, good luck with the assessor and good luck with, uh, good luck with your um, uh, uh, landlord in order to get... I think uh, some other people are trying that now, to try and get the rent reduced. Good luck with that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I want to still uh, go on about the fact that if I... Workplace parking levy, and that's in the name. Workplace parking levy. So that means a parking space in a workplace. Do you think employers who are under pressure with uh, paying this, paying that, and all the rates, whatever, um, would require their staff who use a workplace parking space to pay the levy instead of them paying the business paying it? And would it be realistic, and, and the point that uh, Helm made earlier, would it be realistic to expect employers to ex exempt lower pay workers from paying the workplace parking levy? Or would they just say, well, everybody will just pay it, because can, I'm not going to pay it? Can, Richard, can I bring Helen in first? Because I, I, I didn't let her answer the last question, and I see that she's keen to answer this one. <laughs> Me, I'm always keen. Um, I think the reason why we are concerned that employers are going to pass this on to employees is because the evidence from Nottingham suggests that around half employers pass it on to employees, so um, that's the only thing we really have to work on, and that's why we think it's um, likely to impact employees. Um, I think from our point of view as trade unionists, if this was coming in in a unionised workplace, the union would defend the terms and conditions of the worker and try to ensure that the employer paid it and didn't pass it on to the employee. Um, I think the reality of how that shakes out over the long term, well, it's difficult to know over time things can creep into the employee's um, pay slip, even if they're not necessarily agreed just by ch other changes in terms and conditions. Um, I think the other thing to sort of note is that these things tend to be backwards um, if left to their own devices. So actually, it tends to be the lowest paid workers who aren't exempted from the levy because it'll go into the package of a CEO that you get your parking space. It won't go into the package of a cleaner that you get their parking space. So in some ways, the logic of the workplace is kind of backwards when it comes to defending low paid employees. Alistair, do you want to come in on that? Um, well, I, I mean... Just agreeing with Helen's evidence there that uh, you know Nottingham is the most publicised scheme, and from what we hear, they have passed the cost on. And because local authorities just are so pressed, and you know we don't need to talk about how adult social care is, um, you know, breaking down because because of lack of resources. I imagine that they would seek to recoup any costs that they possibly could. Who else, David? Um, 
so, I mean, I've obviously answered this in part already, and just drawing the link between your question and Stuart Stevenson's question, I guess the issue with business rates is that firms pay it once. With this, they're paying, if this comes in, they'll be paying a tax twice, business rates and the levy on top in terms of their, their parking spaces. So I think the principle changes somewhat, and therefore the, the point that Alistair makes about trying to recoup um, uh, some of the cost from, from staff, you know, it lends itself to that. I think the other thing to bear in mind is obviously, um, you know, our members are extremely uh, concerned, as Colin uh, mentioned earlier on, they're acutely aware of the fact that actually just, not just companies, but individuals uh, have a number of pressures and strain at the moment. We've obviously seen council tax rises, employee pension contributions have gone up. We have things like deposit return schemes coming into effect. There are a number of other issues in the budget accord between the Scottish Government and the Greens that will push up the cost of living. So there's, you know, workers, employees will have a number of issues challenging their own pockets as well. Richard, is there anyone else? Because Pauline would like a question, but if you'd like to direct that to anyone on the panel who hasn't answered that, uh, I'd like to bring in Pauline then and come back to you for your second question. Yeah, that's fair. Pauline. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the question of exemptions that might be discussed at stage two. Maybe Helen could be more... Uh, could give it the answer I need, but anyone else. So I'm interested. So, so, so the Scottish government's uh, poverty strategy identifies that single parents are amongst the poorest. We know that people with a disability are amongst the poorest, and we know that lots of people who work are on universal credit. Um, I just wondered if you had a view um, on the impact of those groups, but any information that you also had about number of single parents in the workplace. Um, the range of salaries for shop workers, for example, and any information, even if not today, at some point, we'd be interested to know if there's any information about the number of people who come to work with a mobility car. Does anyone... Uh, I think that's quite a lot of information for somebody to have prepared to bring to the meeting. It may be something that could be submitted uh, if people were able to track down that information relatively quickly um, and submit it to the committee in writing. Uh, Pauline, I'm, I'm not seeing anyone's... A general that. answer would be fine. I mean, uh, Does somebody want to try a general? Uh, Helen, do you, I mean, do you want to just try a general one on that? OK, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the, the amendment did helpfully say that blue badge holders would be exempt, and I think that would be absolutely essential. And it, 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 it wouldn't make a lot of sense not to do that, um, given, given the use of such schemes as the mobility scheme. Um, I think the more challenging issue is, is around lone parents, for example, or parents in general, actually, because um, one of the things that you have to do as a parent is take, and as a working parent in particular, is take your child somewhere to be looked after and then go to work. And that means for a lot of parents that using public transport isn't really an option um, because you have to make the nursery run and then you have to get to work for the start time and then you have to get back for the nursery run. As a working mother for many, many years, I was always chasing my tail, I was always working through my lunch, I was always um, running everything up to the deadline to get back for the nursery pickup. And the idea of suddenly putting in an extra train or putting in you know, a train and then a subway and then a bus, I mean, for me, that was just untenable. I wouldn't have been able to do it. I would have had to have suddenly find a completely different childcare option because I wouldn't have been able to use the local authority nursery. Um, so, and I think that's an issue that is difficult to get around with just a pure exemption because those people will fall into a whole range of categories. They'll be hard to identify, but it's a very, very real pressure and it's a pressure that falls on women in particular. Okay. Thank you, Helen. I think that was a, 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 a good, good answer there. Alistair, you wanted to come in, then I'm going to come back to Richard Law. Just to say quickly, our workers are 80% women, and um, they're working on average 13 hours a week extra that they're not being paid for. And unfortunately, still, women are disproportionately uh, taking more of a role in family life, caring for children and parents. Thank you. Richard, can you you want yeah. to follow that up? Um, so many witnesses have raised concerns about that employees may switch from parking in a workplace car park to an on-street parking following the introduction of a workplace uh, parking levy. That may antagonise the relationship between employers, residents, pose a safety risk to loan and shift workers, 
And anyone who parks in, I've, I've got quite a number of industrial estates in my, in my constituency, anyone who parks in their workplace may actually take it out of there and go and park in the, on the road uh, in the industrial estate or the business park and clog up uh, the streets there. So um, would you uh, support the concerns that people are making that uh, if this is introduced, it will cause a lot of bother? Colin, you nodded first. I'll bring you in. Yeah, I, I already picked up or mentioned that earlier. That is a real concern, and actually it has been noted in, in Nottingham. Um, certainly some of our, our members um, have uh, depots across the country and, and one in Nottingham. Um, and, and that is, a, is reality that um, there has been a move from um, workplace uh, parking onto, on street parking. That then has meant the council has then had to go around and put double yellow lines, which then moves people further out um, of, of those areas. And indeed, they've had congestion issues um, that they're now having to spend money on um, reorganising roads, etc., to, to deal with the congestion that, that this, has, this workplace parking levy has created down there. Um, so, yeah, as, as proven that is, that is happening, and it's our concern that. Um, again, under the, the, the safety of our employees, that, um, that the parking on streets uh, is, is going to. David Bells, do you want to come in on that? I think um, the, you know, the, the displacement of the parking onto uh, streets is uh, an obvious way for, for workers to save money if, if the uh, employer transfers this new tax upon them. Uh, and it will work in some places. But in other places, such as Edinburgh, the, the, the cost of parking on the street is, is very high in itself. Um, I, I was going to sort of echo some of the comments that uh, Alistair made earlier about teaching, for example. The uh, majority of teachers are, are women, and uh, many have caring responsibilities, and therefore echo the, um, the words that Helen was saying. Uh, and finally, I would say, looking at the uh, submissions, Unison uh, have made a, a submission, uh, a sister union, and, and they make the point that in Not Nottingham, They've raised a, I think it's a, a grievance, a collective grievance on behalf of low-paid workers, who uh, they feel uh, have taken a disproportionate hit with the workplace um, parking levy in Nottingham. Okay. Yeah, it's um, drawn to my attention that quite a number of teachers park in the school, and the, the and, and in the school I was standing at on Thursday, they had 25 parking spaces for the teachers. Now, if everybody went out and parked on the road, uh, which doesn't have a, a double yellow line, uh, as you see quite a lot of, sadly, quite a lot of people misuse their car parking near a school when they're collecting. Uh, if they could park up at the classroom, they would. Um, so do you think that most teachers would then take their cars out the, if they had to pay this? Uh, would take the cars out the um, school and park them on the road somewhere, and, and again that would affect their safety. Yes, I, I think a, a workplace parking levy would affect uh, teachers' behaviours uh, if they currently park in schools. We're assuming that the local authority will, will transfer the cost. Um, we are assuming that it will be around five hundred pounds, it may be more, it may be less. Uh, for, for those teachers that uh, have seen the value of uh, pay in real terms fall in, in over uh, years and years, then every, um, every expenditure is carefully monitored, and if you can avoid making that expenditure, you will. And for some, they may go on the public transport, but for very many, uh, that is not going to be a credible option. Not only that the, the public transport won't get you to your school in time, but it won't allow you to drop off your child or, or uh, other responsibilities before you get to the, to the school. Also, teachers tend to carry uh, their work home, uh, and that includes materials and um, also, uh, preparation of materials and uh, pupil uh, work. And therefore, uh, parking the car on the road, uh, having a longer walk, is problematic for, for many people uh, for many teachers, uh, and therefore, you know, these are all areas of concern for us uh, with this uh, proposed levy. Um, just, just on that, and, and, and I, I think, having looked 
uh, or heard what people want to talk about. We, we haven't really addressed the safety issues. Does anyone feel there are safety issues? Uh, I, I mean, Helen, you've mentioned about shift workers in the evening, but there'll be some people in, in employment where they're worried about parking their car away uh, from where they work because they could be accosted on the street and that sort of thing. So is that an issue, David? Do you want to, do you want to push on that? Well, I'll start by saying the, the carrying of heavy loads from, um, from where you park your car to where you work, I think, is problematic. I think that uh, for those of us who have seen outside schools and uh, where, where lots of people park, it's dangerous. Uh, cars are often parked close together, and I think it will add, uh, raise road uh, safety concerns. Um, in, in terms of safety, whenever you're adding an extra journey uh, or an extra element to your workplace, uh, then it always raises risk. OK. Um, uh, Fiona, do you want to...? I just, um, would just like to say, convener, that obviously um, in our two key Scottish locations we have a lot of shift workers and there is overnight work, so it is really important, because they're out-of-town locations, that you know, our people are able to bring their car into, into the office. And as yet we've taken no decision whatsoever as to whether we would pass on any levy if it was implemented, but we would, I continue to press that we want to see some recognition of those organisations who have taken some measures. OK. John, briefly, and then we're going to move on to Colin Smith. Mr Bercy, um, is it the case that all of your members have access to parking at the premises they work from? I didn't quite appreciate how dangerous parking in the street was. It seems to be a, a big issue to a number of people. I, I don't believe that all teachers uh, have uh, access to car parking in their schools. Uh, it depends on the nature of the school premises. Well, given the concerns you've raised John, about the implications... John, I, I said one question. I, I, you have had quite a few, and I am concerned that we have got a lot to go through. So, uh, I mean, I'm I'll happy to... I'll follow up with the committee. Thank uh, you. Colin, you, you, you've got the next question. Thanks very much, convener. It was mentioned earlier that, that, that um, this is effectively enabling legislation. It enables 32 different local authorities to have potentially one or more um, workplace parking levy schemes within um, their particular area. I'm just keen to get the panel's views on what challenges potentially having multiple different schemes in different parts of Scotland is likely to bring uh, to your organisation. I guess that's probably directed at um, David and Colin, uh, probably, <laughs> primarily to start with. Who'd like to go first? I'm happy to go first, uh, convener, so th uh, thank you for the question. Um, clearly, um, if, if multiple uh, local authorities introduce uh, the levy, then there'll be multiple uh, billing authorities uh, to deal with. Um, <laughs> Going back to sort of business rates for a second, one of the strengths of the reform agenda that the Scottish Government are pursuing at the moment is they're looking to standardise bills across Scotland. Uh, so we'd like to see something similar uh, if this levy uh, is approached. Um, my understanding is that actually um, in Nottingham, um, you can actually apply uh, online uh, for the levy. So, you know, simple uh, mechanisms that make it simple and easy for companies to apply uh, would, be, would be hugely uh, beneficial as well. Um, obviously, um, making decisions in good time um, so that uh, companies can factor this into their budgeting uh, would be helpful as well. Um, I think I saw from... from either Mr Finney's uh, paperwork or from uh, the Nottingham example talk about eight weeks or something like that, whereas the Scottish Government signals its tax decisions um, you know, in terms of the amount to be charged, who's going to be liable four months in advance. So these are some of the things we'd look to see um, a degree of consistency uh, and approach across uh, councils in Scotland who are implementing the levy. Colin, do you want to come in on that? Uh, certainly, I uh, agree with everything that David was saying, and that it's the complexity of our members working across different councils. With, um, I guess, we need some standardisation, definitely, of, of what defines a, a workplace uh, or a parking space. Because I noticed in Amendment Eight, and it talks about a workplace including business customers, business visitors, um, and uh, and so on. And um, if the definition is left up to the council to determine, then that causes problems um, across our members and, and, I guess, for any business. Um, 
I note last week that Nottingham Council was saying that the, the beauty of this proposal or the workplace parking levy is that the flexibility will uh, flexibility is good and well, but it's actually clarity that they, they would require within this and a standardisation, as David uh, says, across the councils and how it's implemented, the cost especially, uh, to be equal so that everyone knows what they're paying. Colin. Given the advocates of the levy strongly argue this should be passed on to the workers because the reality is they see it as a financial stick, if you like, to encourage people not to use their car, and that's the whole point of it. Uh, according to organisations, for example, the, uh, the lead uh, councillor for Glasgow City Council on Transport um, actually argued that point to this committee last week. Uh, one of the concerns that some people have, though, that if it is passed on to um, employees, it doesn't really reflect the ability to pay because it's a flat rate. Do you think there should be um, built in to the legislation that this has to be based on ability to pay, or should that be left entirely up to each individual employer to decide? Um, as I said, obviously, a little bit like uh, Aviva, um, we'd wait to see whether or not this power came into effect and whether any councils would want to um, flex it before you know, our members took a view on whether or not to pass over uh, the cost to staff. Um, that might be an option. It might be, it might be sim I'm not an HR person or a finance payroll person, so that may be easy to do. It may be complicated uh, to do. But obviously, um, I mean, there are some things I think this committee could usefully do. So is look at the amount uh, that's going to be levied and consider, as we said in our submission, whether or not there should be a cap. We have business uh, improvement districts in Scotland. They are term limited. I think this committee could usefully look at whether or not that should apply uh, in this instance as well. Another point that perhaps should have uh, raised earlier on, I think my, my reading of Mr Finney's amendments and the policy narrative, if it's correct, is that councils could opt to apply the levy in parts of the local authority as opposed to the, the local authority area in its entirety. I guess one perhaps minor, perhaps somewhat unfounded concern would be that uh, councils might decide to draw a line on a map that excludes their own uh, council headquarters or their own premises or indeed um, you know, other bits of uh, uh, you know, business parks or commercial parks where they have their own fiduciary or financial interest at stake. So I think this committee needs to be alive to that as well. Does anyone else want to, to come in on that? Colin, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to push on unless you've got a follow-up. I, I, I do have a, a follow-up that it has been suggested earlier that, 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 that the number of schemes may be limited because it may only simply be on cities. Um, in fact, there could be more than one scheme in a city, but it could be on cities um, where the, it's been argued, and I think wrongly, that there's sufficient public transport. But that, that completely ignores the fact that not everybody who works in a city actually lives in that city. Substantial number of my constituents in the south of Scotland, thousands in fact, travel every day, for example, from the borders into Edinburgh to work. Um, but this levy is simply based on local authority boundaries uh, and not wider boundaries. Do you have any views on how you could overcome the fact that a constituent of mine, for example, living in the borders, would ha where there's very limited public transport, would have to travel into Edinburgh City Centre using their car, but they have absolutely no say whatsoever on whether that levy is imposed because it's a matter entirely for Edinburgh City Council. Not a single penny raised by Edinburgh City Council will be spent in improving public transport within the borders area to help that particular constituent. Do you have any views on how you can overcome that challenge that this is local authority boundaries, but actually thousands of people out with that boundary will actually have to pay that levy but get none of the apparent benefits from it? <coughs> Um, does anyone want to? Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at Helen and Alistair maybe for, for input into that. But, but. I don't have a solution, but I do share the concern. Um, I, I think it's 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 very clear that this would impact um, commuter commuter towns potentially quite negatively because um, they. You know, there's a whole range of people who would be travelling into work who have no choice but to take their car. And for them, it's a matter of um, simply paying the levy and continuing to drive, which is one of the reasons why this doesn't impact congestion very well, because a lot of people just have to pay. Um, but the 
um, the, the improvements just aren't seen by, by those workers and for them there's just no way to avoid paying and that's one of the unfairnesses within it and I think there's a range of unfairnesses here that are difficult to get around and the system come, becomes more and more complex as you try to solve small issues with exemptions or, or, different, or different ways of running the scheme and to a certain degree it, that's, it, it's just, it doesn't create that much money either for the local authority to transform their local, uh, their um, public transport potentially as well. So there's a, just a whole range of questions here that, that, that need to be considered. I'm going to briefly bring in John uh, before I ask another panel member. Very much what was on that point. Um, I mean, one of the amendments to the amendment that's been lodged is suggesting that regional transport partnerships as well as uh, councils might be the better body to implement this to overcome that challenge. Would any of you think that was better than a council or at least an option? Alistair, do you want to go on that? I mean, I certainly <coughs> think that um, a lot of people are travelling and a lot of our members are travelling, particularly to city centres, and because of the type of the um, work, the, the intervention they do in communities don't usually live in the communities they, they, they work in. Okay. Um, does it, does anyone else want to come in? That uh, there are lots of questions, so I'm happy to move on. We may cover it later. Mike, would you like to come in with yours? Good morning, Good morning panel. <clears throat> um, my question is really focused on, on David Lonsdale and the, and the uh, his submission, in which he said in paragraph 15, we would be con uh, concerned if the workplace parking levy opened the door to allowing local authorities to extend the levy to customer parking. Um, I don't know if he's aware, but in the amendment from John Finney, um, it does include the phrase, which is therefore caught, uh, business customers. So the cust customers of the business are being caught by this legislation. Is, 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 David, are you, are you aware of that? Thank you for, thank you for bringing that to my uh, attention. Um, uh, this is something we have, uh, you know, obviously, let me take it back a step. So, uh, retailers tend to, to provide park. Where they provide parking, it tends to be focused for customers. It's not necessarily delineated for staff, um, unlike maybe kind of Eva or other um, companies in other sectors. Um, so, this is a, a real worry. I did notice, I think, from Glasgow Council's evidence, they had said they, look, they want a wider power uh, on parking. Um, so, I guess our concern would be this would be the thin end of the wedge on that front. Um, and obviously, if, um, if wider parking at retail, um, retail shops or um, you know, retail properties and, and premises uh, were, was brought in, then we're talking about a significant uh, increase in terms of the cost of that, um, quite marked uh, increase in the cost of it. So yes, that would be a concern. What you're saying is it would have a major effect. We're not just talking about the workplace parking for the employees of the businesses but the amendment is talking about business customers. Uh, and, and my interpretation of that certainly, and I'm going to pursue this because I've now lodged today an amendment to take those phrases out to make, to make John Finney's bill more acceptable. Um, not that I think it is anyway, but it make it more reasonable. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make that clear to John. Um, the, the question, Mike. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> The question is, I'm, surpri I'm surprised you haven't actually focused on that as a more of a bigger impact on your members. Well, my, my understanding, my interpretation of that, it means, um, uh, you know, it, it means people like um, uh, sort of contractors and suppliers and people like that could come into. Uh, it, part of the problem, uh, if I may, is the fact that we simply don't have enough detail. I mean, it's the paucity of detail about what all this actually means in practice is is startling. Um, and that's why I said right at the outset, you know, um, we, we don't have any sort of economic or impact assessment about this. We haven't teased out. A lot of the questions are great questions, but should have been teased out to a certain extent by some sort of uh, impact and regulatory statement about this policy. I mean, it's, it's, it's startling. On a charge to customers other than through higher prices. So the impact of this amendment would, uh, I assume, through your, if you correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming through your members that you would have to either absorb it into the business out of profit or you have to pass that on and increase prices to customers. Isn't that the logic of that? 
Well, um, retailers are in the business of trying to provide excellent value to their customers and will do as much as they possibly can to uh, ensure that they keep prices down. But it's incredibly difficult for all the reasons we talked about earlier on, this sort of great wave of cost pressures that are coming through. And we understand that you know, the public sector doesn't necessarily have the money itself, but the other side of the equation is that these things do have to be paid for, these taxes. So you, know, you can only spend the money once. Colin, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, and I, just picking up on your comment there, Mike, you're absolutely right, and that's why I, I was mentioning about Amendment 8 and the definition of what is a workplace parking. Um, certainly, if it includes business customers, you know, we're talking about um, convenience stores throughout all your communities, the 4,972 uh, convenience stores, your local cafe, pub, club, restaurant, anywhere you go and buy food and drink is probably service through one of our members. Now, the majority, I'm not saying the majority, certainly um, a lot of our members operate a cash and carry depot, whereby the convenience store operator will come and pick up their juice, their crisps and, 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 and such not from those locations. By nature of the animal, they come in a van, they're going out with trolley loads of, of, of goods, not carrier bags. So if you know, we're, we're suddenly being hit, the, the business uh, customer is in effect being charged or the business, our members have to absorb it, um, that's prohibiting our members to operate. You know, a car park space for our business members is, is an absolute by pure nature of what we are, we are doing at, you know, and what we are offering. In terms of being able to absorb that cost, um, being right at the very start of the supply chain, the wholesaler um, is the one that is actually squeezed the most because he can only raise his cost so much um, because actually the, the cost price to the convenience store or the restaurateur is dictated by the, the, the market price, and that comes from the multiples, the supermarkets and the discounters. They're the ones that are actually dictating the wholesaler's cost price because the retailer can't go much beyond the, the, the price that a supermarket is paying, otherwise they become uncompetitive and, and, and they then can't compete and survive, etc. Just on the cost, our wholesalers their, their net margins are less than 1%. This is a, a high volume, low margin business that we are operating. So that is why you know, we are opposed to this workplace parking levy, because that cost won't be able to be absorbed by our members. And as I said, 82% will pass this cost on to the employee. It's the employee and ultimately the consumer that, that, that will pay for, for this. It can't be absorbed within the cost. Um, uh, stream, unless everywhere, everyone's willing to pass on the, these increased costs in, in, in the form of the, the final goods that people, that people uh, buy. Okay, uh, I think we're at the end of that section. Uh, Jamie, you wanted to, to lead off on some questions. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm going to um, ask a question of why this is perhaps a confusing issue for the committee. Um, we're receiving very conflicting evidence in terms of our written submissions from various stakeholders as to how we should approach this levy. Um, the next panel will include uh, some proponents of it and we'll have perfect opportunity to ask them suitable questions. But in the submission from Sustrans, one of their statements is, I quote, a workplace parking levy is a progressive policy that is likely to be of greatest benefit to people on lower incomes. If I look at the STUC submission, I believe you represent over half a million workers in Scotland. You say that this disproportionately has a negative impact on those with the lowest incomes. So who are we to believe? Well, I think we're both trying to present an analysis of a policy that isn't in place yet. And um, that we don't have that firm proposals of. I mean, I think it's probably a question of um, sort of assumptions that we're making within this policy. So I can lay out what my assumptions are, and I'm sure you can ask the next witness what their assumptions are, and then you can wear it up. But um, the assumption that I was making here was the fact that a lot of low-paid workers are going to be faced with this levy. 
and that it wasn't going to revolutionise public transport to quite the degree that I think maybe the next panel might believe that it will. And the reason that I believe that is because I look at the transport bill as a whole and I see problems within that bill that prevent um, bus transport in particular from really um, getting the investment and the attention that it needs in order to improve. I look at the costs associated with other large-scale transport schemes, which run to hundreds of millions of pounds for tram upgrades, for real upgrades, for that kind of transformative thing. And then I look at how much the workplace um, levy raises in Nottingham, which is £9 million. Pounds. And I think Nottingham has done some interesting things here. Nobody can say that they haven't, but they haven't done it on the workplace levy alone. And um, I think it's right to think about the other, the wider context of, of the Scottish economy. So the issue of austerity and ongoing austerity for local authorities, I think, is an issue. The fact that the Scottish National Investment Bank will not be able to invest in, pu in the public sector and will therefore not be able to support large-scale transport infrastructure um, is also an issue that needs to be taken into account. So we need to think about where the other sources of funding would come from in order to develop this transport this transport infrastructure. And I go back to the issue of buses, because I think the buses is the one area where £9 million pounds might actually make a difference. But if the local authority cannot run a municipal bus company and cannot really invest properly in that, in that local network, which this transport bill doesn't allow them to do, then I just don't think that it unlocks the potential sufficiently um, in order to get the sort of impacts that would benefit low-wage low workers. Instead, it just becomes a tax on low-pay people who are already living in poverty and already having a difficult time. I'm sure the committee will reflect on your comments on bus franchising and will address that next Wednesday when we, we meet for stage two. But does it, do any other panellists have a view on... David, uh, they, they David think, wants to come in on that particular you, point, Jimmy. Yeah, I think that the first thing to, to say is that the, the levy is proposed as a flat rate tax, and I think it's generally accepted that flat rate taxes are not progressive. Um, a, a person who is on £15,000 a year, who's hit by a £500 tax, is going to be uh, have quite a hit. That may affect their lifestyle, whereas somebody on £100,000, a uh, company director, I think one of the committee members referred to earlier, uh, wouldn't be affected by that. Um, there's also a, um, a, an assumption in, in some of the submissions I read that, that poor people don't use cars, so they won't be hit. Uh, and I think that's fundamentally wrong. I think uh, another thing is that the, the benefit of, of this, uh, you know, the taxes raised, will somehow affect some parts or the poorer parts of, uh, of local authorities more than others as if uh, some uh, poorer communities have different air than other parts of, of the, the city they live in. And I think that's uh, quite a, a stretch to, to uh, take that with the current evidence before us. Thank you. And can I move on to another question? And that's uh, that of, I think, one of the fundamental uh, issues facing us as, as to whether we should accept these amendments. Uh, and that's that proponents of the policy say that this simply is an enabling power that gives local authorities the ability to decide for themselves if they want to implement the levy. I, so I come back to the earlier line of questioning on this. Uh, what would your advice be to the committee when considering whether we should or should not give this power to local authorities? That seems to be everyone uh, down the table. <laughs> um, is there anyone particularly, Jamie, you want to target that at? Whoever has a strong view on it. Um, David. Con convener, we're, we're not supportive of the, the levy, so hopefully that's a, a short answer to your question. But just if I may, just going back to your previous question about people on, on lower incomes, um, I think an impact assessment, if I may, um, might have teased out that even if uh, the levy is not recharged to staff, um, it can still affect them. So, for example, a number of our members operate a bonus scheme which is dependent on the profit, profit, profits derived from individual stores. So you may find that actually um, money that uh, was available for, for staff bonuses um, is somewhat diminished because of that. So there are a more rounded consideration of the policy, I think, would have teased out some of these issues as well. So you may find staff are affected, even if they're not necessarily themselves recharged for whether it's four or five hundred pounds. Um, anyone else want to come in on that? I mean, my point being is that if if 
if the panelists are saying to us that there is merit in a conversation around this as a, as a, as a matter of policy, but this is not the way to introduce it, would it be better, therefore, to uh, take it out of this bill and postpone it and have a proper, sensible, uh, grown-up consultation about it in terms of how it may be implemented and the effect it may have on workers or businesses? Helen, do you want to...? I mean, we're against the workplace parking levy. You, you bring it back in another bill next month, we'll still be against the workplace parking levy. Um, I think, you know, we would maybe take a different view if it was coming with a, with a, with a big strategy around it, a, a, a green strategy on investment and other forms of money and an end to local authority um, austerity. But unless that's what you're proposing, I wouldn't be expecting different answers next month than what you're getting this month. Sorry. Just, just in, a, a question I've got is, is one of the issues of people using uh, cars was the uh, part of the bill is a low emission zones which will require people to upgrade their cars from uh, to meet a Euro 6 classification where there are uh, low emission zones in Scotland. So that would mean a lot of cars pre-2015, I think, have to be, uh, cannot be used without a cost to go into the low emission zone. Do you think the combination of a charge for the low emission zone and a work pace parking levy may hit uh, those who can least afford to pay it hardest? That's just a question. Um, Helen, do you want to do on that? Yeah, I think, I think that's right. I think um, we're also particularly concerned about how that hits um, public vehicles as well. So, uh, And we'd hope the committee would reflect on that. But um, we are concerned about the sort of impact on this and the fact that people don't often have another choice. And I think that's what we're trying to say primarily, is that um, sometimes there just isn't a public transport offer available to people that is effective and that meets their needs and that allows them to, to balance their other responsibilities. And then they have to make a decision about whether work is still profitable to them. And that is a really hard choice. And I think most people want to work and they want to continue to work and we would never want to to, to ever prevent people from being able to do that. And the reality for most workers is that they will, con they will have to continue to work. It'll just mean that they continue to work but live in a greater level of poverty. OK. I think we move on to the next question, which is from Maureen Watt. Maureen. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, panel. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion so far. And there's been this assumption that the workplace parking levy, which is a levy on business, will automatically in, be transferred on to employees so that it protects the bottom line of the business owners and, and their shareholders so that they're not affected. And then, you know, you've all talked about the possible implications uh, on employees on, in different ways. So I wonder just how many of the organisations that you represent have actually done a proper analysis and a cost-benefit analysis on passing the levy on uh, to employees. So, uh, in relation to, for example, the Scottish Wholesale Consortium, um, you say that you conducted a, a survey of your members. Could you maybe tell us what questions you were asked, what proportion of members responded to uh, the survey, and what are the key findings of the survey? And have they actually looked at the total costs? to businesses and to whether it really is something that you genuinely want to pass on to employees, given all the uh, problems that you have all highlighted for your employees. Colin. Uh, thank you. Scottish Wholesale Association, just uh, for, for clarity. Um, certainly, we have we sent a, a survey out to all our members um, on the workplace parking levy uh, prior to, to coming here today. Um, we didn't have much time, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, um, to do full in-depth analysis of um, the answers or get a full response rate. I will say that within the, the, the week that, that we had out there, we had a 35% response rate um, from our members, which um, actually is, is quite high, cons certainly considering consultations, except they normally take three months. Um, the, the, there was a host of questions asked from whether they wanted it, what their concerns about it was, um, whether there were agreements that council should have the, the power 
um, to implement this or whether it should be government-led. Um, as I say, I've already quoted some figures that 92 per cent um, of our membership uh, have, have shift workers. 82 per cent are going to pass or, or would be looking to pass this on to their employees. Um, and that is, goes back to the fact that we are a low-margin business. Every cost at the top needs to come off at the bottom. Um, so, you know, David's talking about the, the rates. That's a huge implication or a huge cost to, to our business, um, as is the deposit return scheme that's coming in and members are uh, going to have to build extra warehouse space to, to hold the, the, the dual stock, the English stock and Scottish stock. Um, that's a cost of fi uh, 500,000, as one of our, uh, one of our members um, said. Um, Track and trace has just been implemented um, within our sector, tracking tobacco all the way through the market. Um, so all these cumulative costs um, impact the profitability. If our margins are low, it ultimately the quick fix and the, is, is on staffing, to be honest. Um, you know, there's only so much you can take out of, of the cost um, of, a, of a packet of crisps. Um, Certainly, Nottingham, um, as I said earlier, there is some affiliate members down there. Um, one of them have reduced their, their workforce in the last year, in the last the past uh, year, by 20 members. Not just the cost of the WPL, but the cumulative costs that are hitting the food and drink industry. Um, certainly, I would, I would be more than happy to share some of the other figures that came out of our survey with you, if that would would help. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I answered fully your question or if okay, you've got anything else you would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, and the next question is... Stu sorry. Yeah, sorry, David, I didn't, I didn't see you. I apologise. David. I, I think it's important not to look at the levy as simply a tax on business. It's a potential tax on workplaces, on schools, on uh, libraries, on colleges, on places where social services are carried out. It's a tax on, on parking in workplaces. And I think the other point I'd like to make is, you know, people are talking about, well, the assumption is it goes on to, on to staff, and, and I think uh, some of the early questions. But in order for it to deliver its environmental aims, to reduce congestion, to improve the, the air, it has to be passed on to workers. And it has to change workers' behaviours in order for fewer people to drive to work. That's the logic of it. So, I mean, uh, I, I find it quite ironic that some people are saying, well, why is it being transferred to workers? I, that's, that's, that's the only way in which there is an environmental benefit to what is to offset a cost on workers. That's the, the balance, I think, which the committee is, is, is posed with. Yeah, um, Ms. Watt mentioned cost-benefit uh, analysis. We absolutely think there should be a cost-benefit analysis, but it should have been accompanying um, the amendments, at least, or at least uh, signalled in advance. And I do think, um, totally get that um, the government needs to, to work with other parties to pass its budget, and there'll be a give and take uh, on these things. But I, d I do think this issue actually throws up a broader question about the approach um, towards sort of budget accords, if you like, in the round and whether sufficient rigour um, and analysis is given to policy making. I, I don't have a solution to that, but I think it's unsatisfactory in the sense you get policies like this, and I, I don't disparage Mr Finney's um, thinking behind it. Well, what because I'm going to let him come in afterwards when he's answered, when you've answered <laughs> but, this. But I do think this does raise broader broader questions about policy making in the, in the round on that front. And on, it's difficult for companies to work out um, you know what the impact would be. We, we simply don't know who's going to be liable. We do not have a clue what the tax rate uh, would be. We don't know whether it's going to be a slab tax, whether thresholds are going to apply, how long would it apply for. I mean, it's, it's a sort of pig in a poke uh, policy. We have no idea what we're buying into in many respects. So. Um, I'm going to let John come back and ask a question. Well, ironically, it's not to Mr Lonsdale, who clearly is very familiar with all parliamentary uh, procedures. Everyone seems to commend localism. Everyone seems to think there is an issue about climate emergency. It's a, it's a question for Mr uh, Belsey. Do you imagine, given some of the representations we've heard, that your members would say you've already ceded that they are going to pay for this? Because I, you know, as someone who was involved in 
worked in place negotiations for two decades. It's a peculiar position that both yourself and indeed the STUC seem to have taken on it. And behaviour can be shaped in many ways. And an improved availability of public transport, for instance, would make it everything suggests if there's better public transport, people are less likely to use them with the vehicle. So, David and Helen, you both get a chance to come well, back. I, I think we would all welcome improved public transport, uh, improved links uh, for, 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 to allow commuters to use public transport more effectively and, and allow people to make that, that choice themselves. Um, the, I, I guess the worry for, uh, for people who are concerned about this particular amendment is that it's a government-sponsored uh, uh, amendment with, uh, with, with the Green Party, which means it has got an inbuilt majority. So that's, that's the... Uh, pun? No, no, we, 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 that, that's... Uh, <laughs> Ms, I, 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 that, first, first of all, first of all, I think that's unfair, uh, because I, and, and I would make the comment to you, David, that not all members of the government necessarily support this, um, as, as we've seen. So democracy will take its course, and, 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 and John, with the greatest respect, I, I think, well, criticising... The, avoidance of doubt, the reason for these comments are because people are making overt party political comments. It's so <coughs> appropriate that I'm facilitated the opportunity to respond and to in them, fairness, as I did there. Now, I, I'll leave it at that. Right. In, fair, in fairness, Mr Finney, I don't know who, whose party politics is around this table. I'm just listening and, and taking evidence for, from a mixed group of people. Uh, and the next panel may have a different party political view. I don't really care. I'm listening to the evidence, as I hope all the committee are, and we park our politics at the door. We're looking to see if we can pass good legislation. So, <coughs> on that basis, Helen, I will let you briefly come in while I get rid of my cough. <laughs> I mean, we absolutely haven't ceded the point that, um, and if this amendment did come in, trade unions would, and I think I said it earlier in my evidence, trade unions would defend our members' terms and conditions, and we would try to ensure that the employer did not pass it on to the employee. Were that, the, the irony of it, though, is that it is easier to defend the terms and conditions of higher paid workers than lower paid workers, because lower paid workers often work in sectors where we have, where there are very low margins and where um, the employer is seeking to push things down on to the employee more and more regularly. So if you are going to pass an amendment, um, an exemption for social work, for example, would be absolutely essential within this, I think, because of the, the crisis that exists within social work at the minute and the difficulty that trade unions would have in defending our members in that sector. Um, but I would be concerned about our members in retail. I'd be concerned about our members in, in wholesale as well. Um, what I would say here, though, is that you have to remember that not everybody is covered by a trade union and not everybody has the protection of a trade union. And there are an awful lot of low-paid workers who would find themselves basically bargaining alone with their employees on this issue, and I'd be concerned about those workers. And in fairness, we are going to come to exemptions, I'm sure, at some stage before this panel is finished. So, Stuart, uh, the next question is yours. Uh, thank you, and uh, this is a question for Fiona Beale, based on uh, what you say in your submission um, uh, about your passing the charge on to your staff. Now, let me just give some assumptions before I form my question. Um, based, and, and they're essentially Edinburgh-based, so they're not wholly applicable to the locations that Aviva are in. Um, there was five parking spaces in Bread Street in Edinburgh advertised recently uh, for a capital cost of £50,000, uh, an indication that the business rates would be 3700 That works out at £740 per space. Um, so that's a cost that one can project, um, given that business rates uh, and rental go hand in hand, I'm assuming therefore the rental cost would also be 740, so I've got 1,500 pounds near enough. Very round figures and it's very rough and ready, but I want to explain where I'm coming from. Um, now, I've also looked at uh, office space in Edinburgh is 28 pounds per square foot. Um, the average space for a worker is 75 square feet, uh, so that is uh, uh, £2,100 in rental. Rates, same again, so we're up to £4,200. Um, services to provide for that office worker, I personally have estimated, so this is the least robust of, of a not very robust calculation, £1,000. So just for the physical provisioning for a, uh, uh, an employee was 6,700. We then look at 
average earnings, about 27,500. We're now up to 34,000 for provisioning for an employee with a car parking space. We're now looking at, if we look at Nottingham, £400. What is that as an addition to the overall cost? And the answer is 1.2% of the cost of employing someone is attributable to the workplace parking. Um, and furthermore, of course, I'd just make the little point that if it's passed on, the VAT that would be charged on workplace parking that Aviva can recover because they are VAT registered, if you pass on to employee, is an £80 charge that the employee cannot recover. So you're creating a tax uh, on the employee, which the company wouldn't pay. So why this 1.2% increase in the cost of provisioning for an employee, or 2% if you, you know, we can play with quite big bounds on my numbers, why, when it's 1.2% on this particular increase in your costs, are you saying it would be passed on to your employees? When other costs, variations in corporation tax, variations in business rates, variation in rentals, because there'll be rental review periods for the rental premises, why this one particular small proportion of your costs of employing someone are you saying you would pass to your employee? And I haven't even talked about subsidised canteens. I haven't talked about holiday pay and all sorts of other costs there might be. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, 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 and it's I, a simple question. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, but, Fiona, Fiona, just before you answer that, can I can I just say that? Thank, thank goodness uh, Stuart isn't a commercial surveyor because that's not the way rents are worked out and, and costs attributed. But, but Fiona, no, it really isn't, Stuart. But Fiona, do come in and then I'm going to bring in Richard. I, I do think I know where Mr Stevenson, my colleagues, you're reading this in my colleague's letter. Uh, and actually, I think it's been, can I say, quite poorly worded. Um, because actually we haven't taken a decision as to whether we would pass on the cost to staff at all. And actually in town, so in the, in the centre of town, we do charge our staff for car parking. We actually charge uh, £58 a month uh, because, broadly speaking, Aviva is supportive of measures that reduce congestion and take cars off the road in town. And we do think that staff have a range of choices. So where we do have 2,000 employees in Scotland, we are in out-of-town locations, and that's where Aviva's concerns lie. And we absolutely have not committed that we're going to pass this on to staff. Thank you. Computer. Because we've, got, we've, we've already demonstrated we've got a range of transport support options for staff that we're funding already. OK, uh, Richard, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah. Would you agree with all the figures that Mr Stevenson has just detailed, uh, that actually shows how much businesses are paying and how we should not load on more onto businesses and is it a tax too far? Who would like to go with that? I, I'm going to try and bring... Fiona, why don't you, you start on that and, and then I can bring the others in. I don't know if I'm the best person to, to comment on that, Mr Lyle. Um, I am a, I'm working in the property and facilities team at Aviva. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, an expert on this legislation. Um, speaking on behalf of Aviva um, and operating in Scotland, it will be another cost that um, any organisation will have to take into account when choosing where they're going to locate and indeed whether uh, organisations choose to, to operate and locate in, in Scotland. Um, and and it, it won't impact Aviva's thinking. We're, you know, we've got over 2,000 people here. We're massively committed to Scotland. We work with the Scottish Parliament. We work with our lo local representatives. But it may, it may have impacts on others. David. I think uh, Stuart Stevenson's um, uh, information uh, and the way he built his case teases out one sort of key fact, which is there are a heck of a lot of fixed costs, and that's before a retailer sells a single good or product. 
Uh, so there are a lot of fixed costs that have to be, to be met. I mean, I would throw into the mix things like the large business rate supplement. It's higher in Scotland than it is uh, south of the border. That costs Scottish retailers alone an extra £14.1 million a year. That's ministerial figures, not mine. I've not made it off the top of my head. You could add into that the business improvement district levy that many, um, many employers uh, pay as well. Uh, and as I said earlier on, if you're, if you're paying tax twice, then I think you might be, as a company, more inclined to think, well, should we actually uh, be looking either to pass it on or make some savings elsewhere? And as I said, one option might be to reduce your spend on act active travel. That might be worth uh, considering. Another might be to take a less um, positive or generous approach to supporting business improvement districts when they come up for renewal, because 1% uh, you pay a levy 1% of your business rates on that. So there are a number of um, potential consequences that, frankly, would have been teased out if we'd had an impact assessment to accompany Mr Finney's amendments. Colin, do you want to say anything, or are you, uh, are you in broad agreement? Yeah, I'm in agreement. OK. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking to see if anyone else is, is one who's coming. Uh, I think we'll move to Peter's question uh, next. Peter. Thank you, convener, and I will be uh, concise, unlike uh, Mr. Stevenson. My my question is specifically for Mr. Mr. Brown because it, it you you have said, Mr. Brown, in, in your submission that social workers should be specifically exempt from the WPL. Uh, along the same lines, of course, NHS sites are already being uh, going to be going to be exempted. So, can you explain why you think that your your workforce should be should be specifically exempted and uh, have you a concern that if this was an exemption it should be a, a national exemption or should it be allowed to, you know should the individual local authorities have that decision to make uh, for your for your worker thank you I, I think as has already been expressed a number of times because local authorities aren't under uh, so much pressure and I guess a requirement to look at wherever they can make savings because, because the budgets are so tight that we do feel it should be expressed uh, as an amendment. And uh, with all the respect in the world to the members that Helen and David represent, I guess we were making an argument that we, we feel that social workers have a particular and peculiar role of being very kind of actively out in their cars all day visiting people at home, trying to get people out of hospitals and back to other care facilities and doing difficult work dealing with adult and child protection, minimising public harms, carrying confidential and sensitive material and dealing with people and in, in, in interacting with people in difficult uh, circumstances. And so we've had a lot of members being very vocal and vociferous about uh, the, the requirement to access their cars, use their cars, that therapeutic work goes on in their cars as well. So, um, you know, we're kind of taking that on board. And I guess we think that you know, that exemption needs to be thought about because of that, those particular statutory responsibilities. Whereas, I guess, a blanket kind of saying NHS, you know, I think that, that's got to depend on is that person, does that person have good transport links to their work? Are they a shift worker? Um, and are they just based at one site when they're there all day? Is, is, is transporting and is working with the people they work with? Uh, part of what they do with their car, so that doesn't seem to have been articulated in any way. So while we're not as clearly coming out against this, we're kind of saying that we're supportive of, of modal shifts, we're kind of saying that we acknowledge the impact of pollution, particularly on the poor and some of those other submissions, and we don't, we don't have as clear a position. We do feel that uh, our members are very strong on this, and we do think it, it, there should be an amendment for social workers. You, you obviously think that that should be a national thing that, that, that should, should be decided nationally rather than by individual local authorities. Well, I, th I think it's, it's a very complex picture and local authorities are using a mixture. As I say, there might be pool cars or there's the odd electric car or some would say we'll give you access to the Enterprise Car Club and there's all these kind of uh, mixtures of things. But at the end of the day, there's not a, there's not a, a, a robust... Um, our members are telling us there's not robust... Uh, transport options in place to let them uh, replace this constant dependence on their own uh, private vehicles which they're using for work purposes because they might need to go out for example if you were to if I as a mental health officer was to go and get a warrant um, to, to get somebody to hospital who unfortunately was unable to uh, 
look after themselves was a significant risk to themselves or others, I would have to go and visit them several times that day before I was to go to a justice of the peace or a sheriff uh, and get that warrant. It's, it's reactive work. It's, um, you know, it's got to be there and then. We've got, uh, uh, you know, got to respond immediately uh, and, and several times. It can't be scheduled in that way. Thank you for that. I mean, uh, Helen, you did just recently, I just uh, ten minutes ago, speak up for the social work, uh, workers. I mean, you would obviously have a, a similar view to, to, to Mr. Brown, have you? Uh, yes. Well, we would see them as part of part of a healthcare workforce, um, but it's there. There are a lot of issues within social care at the minute, and the treatment of the workforce is. is, is is, is a very serious one. Um, there are lots of social care workers who are very low paid. Um, the living wages, the living wage implementation is something that the STUC has been supporting the government with for a number of years now. Um, and um, to have a workforce who are doing primary health care on the living wage, then facing um, work, workplace parking levies when they can't really not use their car, is you know, it, it isn't a good situation to be in. And I think we also have to recognise the fact that there are recruitment issues within social care already, um, and this would potentially... It's a small thing, but it would potentially impact the, the, cost, of, the cost of work for workers in this sector. Um, because the reality is that for an awful lot of social care employers or private sector employers, uh, they, and they, they, will, or they are likely to pass on. Very good, thank you. Now, my second question is, is specifically to Mr Belsey. Um, the EIS is opposed to the introduction of a, a workplace parking levy. You've said that, you've made that clear. I just wonder, have you spoken with, with your colleagues in Nottingham uh, to understand the impact that it's had in that city on the... On the uh... um, well, I'm afraid there are no EIS colleagues in Nottingham, uh, but I haven't, uh, I haven't had an opportunity to speak to uh, our sister unions, the NEU or uh, others in Nottingham, no. <laughs> So you have no idea how it's impacted on, on teachers in, in, in Nottingham, really? I, I haven't had any specific contact with teachers in Nottingham. OK. Uh, Jamie, you want to follow up? Th thank you. I, th I think a comment was made earlier as to one of the uh, substantive questions we have to address is why should employers pass this on to their employees uh, to protect their bottom line, or I think the words were bottom line or shareholders. But the reality is that actually many in the public service don't account to shareholders, they account to publicly funded organisations with very tight budgets. So can I ask the panel's opinion on if we are looking at exemptions for NHS workers, social workers, teachers and teaching assistants, then why not police officers, firefighters, those that work in care homes or hospices or volunteers who man RNLI stations and so on and so on. Uh, should that exemption list be comprehensive, therefore, to be fair and equal, or should we just target specific types of workplace? Helen, you, you nodded, and then I'm going to bring Fiona in. I think you're getting to why we just don't want to see the levy, because you could make a case for all of those workers that you just... You could make a case for the entire public sector, and then you could make a case for the kind of outsourced public sector, like some of the social care workforce, like some of the child care workforce. You know, you'll have workers who are providing free funded hours in the childcare expansion who will be in a private sector setting. Um, so, you know, you, you can keep going and going and going here. Um, but at some point, I think you, you've got to consider whether or not you should just have this power at all. Fiona, you wanted to come in. It's a, a, a general observation, Mr Green, because you're, you're asking that question and it makes me think, because we're having this discussion in committee, I, I'm wondering, have have we allowed enough time? My understanding is um, that this has been introduced, the workplace parking has been introduced at a late stage in the transportation bill. And, and, and it's a general question is, have we had enough time for consultation and discussion? It, 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 it's, hold on, it's an interesting question when the committee uh, when the committee is asked question by the witnesses. But Jamie, if you'd like to, I, I'm very happy to answer <laughs> questions from witnesses. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, the answer, quite simply, is no, we haven't. Um, okay, uh, David, and then I'm going to come to Rich Law. Th thank you, Convener. So I think I echo um, Helen's point about there are so many. Um, 
uh, examples of, of different parts of society asking for exemptions that really does ask a fundamental question about the policy. But the point I would add is there are plenty of good and deserving jobs within the retail industry. So one of the very topical issues at the moment is about loneliness um, and people having contact on a regular or semi-regular uh, basis with people they know and respect in their local community. And obviously they're, you know, the retail sector and shops provide uh, an element of that. I guess the sort of more fundamental point is that I think there is a strong argument for having relatively few uh, exemptions. That means you have a more broadly based tax and you can actually keep um, the charge or the levy down. Uh, I guess that goes back to Mr Finney and the objectives behind this, is, which is really to put a tax on premises but then use the money to fund um, particular green initiatives. If we're going to actually narrow the tax base markedly, then surely the, the actual tax or the levy charged is going to be even higher than the figures that Stuart Stevenson was talking about. Thank you. Um, Richard, you want to ask a Yeah, would you agree, basically, this is bringing in creative accounting. The council is going to be paying the council because the council, people who are in uh, schools will need to pay or the head teacher will have to pay and therefore the council will be charging the council. No one's disagreeing. Um, no, David. nobody's yeah. disagreeing. That's fine. Um, I think we've come to the end of the question. So I, I've got a question which, um, based on the evidence that we heard last week, is that, and some of the evidence that we've heard this morning, is that the, the message seems to be that if we are going to get the modal shift to people to using other forms of transport apart from their car, that they really have to be buy into the process and the only way they'll do that is not by their employers paying for the congest uh, for the workplace parking levy it's for them to actually feel the pain of it that's that that's what we've heard this morning and we heard last week that there were three options on the table um, when Nottingham considered this there was a congestion charge there were low emission zones and workplace parking levy and they felt that you could only go for one of the three and it was wrong to hit people with more than one of the three because it would be unfair do you my question to each panel member briefly is would you favor another way of achieving the modal shift apart from workplace parking levy i.e a congestion charge or a low emission zone um, who'd like to start off with that david I can give you a very, very simple uh, response to that, um, convener, which is we simply don't have the information at hand to make those uh, decisions. And, and picking up on Ms. Watt's question earlier on, where's the cost-benefit analysis for any of these options? So th th I think that goes really to the heart of this, the problem, our fundamental problem with the workplace parking level. We, as I said earlier on, it's a bit of a pig in the poke. We have very scarce detail about this. We, and, and so being asked to make a decision or uh, take a view now on three different options of which we don't have any sort of economic analysis is, is too challenging. That, that was what I would call a slope's shoulders on that. Fiona, do you want to, to, to make an opinion? I, I, I probably agree, <laughs> agree with what David is saying. And obviously, um, the areas that I'm representing in Aviva are unlikely to um, need any sort of help with air emission and congestion. So I'm probably not best placed to talk about the options as they impact wider city centres. Okay. Alistair, do you want to...? Our recent working conditions survey said that up to 40% of social workers were feeling so stressed and overloaded that they were thinking about leaving the profession. And I think that it's true to say that um, any further pressures are going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back and certainly if there's more than one impacting them on the time because and and what we're saying is there needs to be more sophisticated thought particularly for workers that are actively using their car to carry out statutory and legal duties in a stressful situation thank you very much alistair uh david i think everybody uh would support the aims of a modal shift in um in, in uh, car usage uh, and, and teachers are no exception to that. I think the, the, the problem is around the use of attacks against workers, uh, or could be used against workers, as a stick approach. Uh, and teaching, as, as, as Alistair has you know, pointed out to uh, social work, there are places where teaching uh, is difficult to recruit and difficult to retain teachers, especially in, in, in rural communities. 
and, and some of um, schools in, in poorer areas. And the, the workplace levy and, and you know the congestion charge, low emission zones, they, they, they seem to smack of using the stick. And I think there are more supportive ways in which the uh, workers can choose of their own volition without feeling that they're being pushed into something when they see a more attractive way of travelling to work. And I think that is the way that we would look at going forward. Uh, we, I mean, put simply, we haven't got any policy in place on congestion charges or low emission zones, so I, I can't give you a, a specific answer either. Okay. Thank you. Helen. Um, what we would really like to see is, a, is investment in, in, public, um, in, in public transport, and we'd particularly like to see buses looked at. Um, there's currently 298 million of public money going into the bus system into private companies, and um, we don't think that money is being well used at present. Uh, we're concerned about the franchising system in general. There isn't much competition for bus franchises in local areas. Around half of all franchising contracts receive a single bid. There's no contract. There's no. There's no. Um, there's no competition there at all, which doesn't exactly get the best price for the local authority. Um, and we think that that this system needs to be looked at desperately because right now the number of buses are falling and um, fares are rising by 18%. And uh, the and buses are being withdrawn from local communities. There are now towns and areas in Scotland where there is no bus. This is what needs to be looked at desperately. This is what needs to be unlocked. Um, and we, we believe that more could be done in this space to create a modal shift by ensuring that there is a mode to shift onto. And that's really where we need to look. Thank you, Helen. Colin, briefly. Uh, I would just agree with everything David had said, and especially on the cost-benefit analysis. The one point I would make is that regardless of what is introduced and where it's introduced, our members are delivering across multiple councils all over Scotland. So it could be in Glasgow one day where an LEZ is already in place, um, coming across to Edinburgh where at the moment it's not, and then potentially going up to Dundee where it is, um, or it may be a congestion charge. Um, I think it just creates a whole lot of complexity, whether it be an LEZ, congestion charge, or workplace parking levy. And, and again, it just goes back to the, the cost and managing that and how, how it's paid. Um, it's, it's just becoming burdensome on, on business. Um, so, yeah. OK, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming in and uh, giving us your views this morning. It's been extremely helpful as the committee does go through the democratic process of, of working out whether this is a good amendment to the Transport Bill, which we will decide when we, we go through and look at the amendments uh, to the Transport Bill. But thank you very much for the time and also for your written submissions. And if you have volunteered any additional information that you can give to the clerks, I would ask you just to make sure you do that as quickly as possible. I'm now going to suspend the meeting for um, nine minutes to allow uh, the committee, uh, to committee to take a break and also for the witnesses to change. Thank you. I suspend the meeting.
Thank you. I'd li like to reconvene uh, the committee meeting to hear from the second panel for this session, which will again be focusing on the workplace parking levies, potential environmental, transport and social impacts. I'd like to welcome uh, Sue Flack, the Policy Advisor for Transform Scotland, Alexander Quayle, the Senior Policy Officer from Sustran Scotland, and Stuart Douglas, Smarter Choices, Smarter Places Manager, uh, Paths for All. So thank you. Uh, we have a series of questions. Um, uh, as I said to you, if you catch my eye, if you want to come in, unless the member asks you directly to answer that question, I'll try and bring you in. And again, if you can just not look the other way when you're answering it. So if I feel you're going off, um, Stuart, on the wrong path, I'm, I may call you back. Um, so the first question is from Richard Love. Richard. Thank you, convener. And, and if the convener will allow me, in my constituency, I have quite a lot of industrial estates and uh, business um, estates that are not served by buses. Um, so how would you respond to the concerns that a workplace parking levy would penalise those working in premises not served by adequate public transport or linked to cycling and walking infrastructure? Who'd like to go off on that? Sue. Um, well, one of the things that the workplace parking levy does allow for is by the provision of revenue over a period of time to improve public transport in places where it's poor. So I would suggest that the council that's involved with that, that, those industrial estates talks to the people there, talks to the employers, talks to the employees about what the issues are and devises a plan um, that could be implemented with help from the levy itself as, as a revenue support for that plan. So that might be um, it, uh, increasing the frequency of buses, it might be putting on new services, it might be cycle routes, it might be just putting in a, a path that's not very well lit and uh, needs safety improvements. All those things to help the situation of people who, f who feel that they've got no other choice but to go by car. And then I think if... if if that is done, it, it will sort of soften the impact of the levy, but will also mean that people have got choice. They've actually, it actually improves the situation for workers because they'll have more better choice of how to get to work. Um, Alexander, do you want to come in on that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just mention that the, the first thing would be that local authorities will take a long time to implement such policy. For example, Nottingham's one was agreed in 2009 for a 2012 implementation, so there is a reasonable lead-in period to allow local authorities to, to work with premises to make a change. Um, the other thing I would add is that local authorities will be able to set the geographical scope, and we've seen from the workplace parking levy debate that it can be quite controversial, and I think that one of the things that will inform the choice of where they set it will be the fact that there, there will be choices or alternatives, and they won't want to exclude whole areas uh, from having access of workers. Okay. And Stuart, you want to...? No, I'm fine with that. OK. The next question, then, will be from John Mason. John. Thanks very much. I've got a couple of questions. One follows on from what uh, Richard Lyle was asking. Um, do you think there's enough in the bill, or should there be more in the bill, about where the, the money would go in this area of, you know, should it be improving public transport? I think Nottingham did improve trams, improve train station, and improve buses. Uh, is there enough in the bill about that, that the, the funds are meant going where they should be going? There's something like it should go towards improving <coughs> transport and it leaves a wide range open and it's transport according to the strategy of the local authority that's promoting it, as I understand it. As I understand it. Uh, it's really important that the, that the, the strategy that the local authority is, that is promoting is one which is widely agreed and widely consulted on and covers the sorts of points that were, were being raised there by Mr Lyle. Um, so it's really important that there is a, almost like a jointly prepared transport strategy where people who um, are going to be affected by the levy in whatever way sort of buy into it as much as possible. And I think, on your direct question, I think there is enough in, 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 the, in the bill. Um, it may be that further guidance might be helpful to local authorities who are considering... Um, doing workplace parking levy. I don't know if you've thought about that as a possibility. I, I also advise um, Transport for London, um, and there the mayor is responsible for approving workplace parking levy schemes. Not, not um, it, it only, it's only it's all the responsibility of the mayor, um, not the government. And um, 
they are providing guidance for, for the, the boroughs within London. Um, and um, when the Department for Transport was considering workplace parking levy um, for England and Wales, they, they did they were going to do guidance and do some extra, put some extra guidance, but it never actually got published. So that, that's another option. Yes. The bill allows local authorities to work together. Do you think regional transport partnerships should have a role in this as well? They should have a co they could have a coordinating role. They could do guidance, perhaps. Mm -hmm. They could act like Transport for London and do guidance for the councils within their areas. Mr. Cale or Mr. Douglas, you give that. Well, yeah. I it's about having that variety. There's no, no one answer. So ensuring that uh, the local authorities have got, got the power, got the strategy, understand what those issues are and what the best solutions are. So it needs to be as wide as, wide as possible. Okay. Um, and I'd say I think there's definitely benefits to coordinating regionally, though I don't think Sustrans would support workplace parking levies having to be implemented with regional agreement. I think it should be on a single local authority basis. Um, on the question of uh, does the bill say enough about what the funding is for, I think it's vital that the funding is ring-fenced, so we agree with that provision within the bill. Um, but we appreciate the flexibility of it. It is revenue funding, but it could be used, for example, to match fund for active travel grants that Sustrans administers on behalf of Transport Scotland. Um, and one thing I was very taken with from the evidence session last week was within the funds that it takes to run the workplace parking levy, there are officers that help work with workplaces in order to ensure that they uh, know that they are complying, but also to help them work with their employees to offer alternatives as well. So we think that that's, that's a very valuable tool that should be included. Thank you. The other area which has been raised with us um, I wanted to ask you about was the thought that uh, workers, if they've got a choice and if they think they're going to be impacted by a charge, uh, might just choose to park off-site. And that, that could c cause well, further congestion, say, near a school or, or near some other workplace. Uh, what would your reaction to that be? The local authority promoting the workplace parking levy is likely to be the same one that has the responsibility for parking on streets as well. There, there may be issues at boundaries, but it's likely to be the same authority. And that authority can control parking on streets. And what Nottingham has done is basically have a programme of um, going round um, all the areas where there was displaced parking due to workplace parking levy, where the people parked outside instead of parking on, on site, and control those control those streets. In some case, in some places, they've actually put in charging mechanisms on street where where it's suitable to actually park on street, and in some cases, they've uh, put in residence parking zones and similar to actually prevent that parking on on street. Where there's a boundary, the the council that's promoting the authority, the, the authority that's promoting workplace parking levy has to work with their neighbouring council. And again, Nottingham has done this as well uh, for the edges of the area. So you think it's something that's fixable? It's fixable. You have to have a programme of, of, of doing on-street parking mm -hmm. controls or on-street parking charges as well. and, and go round. This, this can also be funded from the levy receipts, so it's not an additional cost to the authority. OK, thank you. Um, Alexander, do you want to come in on that? Yes, um, I think displacement absolutely could be an undesirable consequence of this, but to use your phrase, yes, it's, it's definitely fixable. Local authorities have the powers available to them in Scotland, and in a way it comes timely as the Transport Bill will iron out some of the issues with parking enforcement that we do have as well. Okay. John, is that you? Okay. Um, yeah, Peter. Can I just come back on, on, on that subject? You, you know, you say you say it's fixable. What you what you actually mean is you're you're going to uh, prohibit the driver from parking on street as well. So you know you're really you're really using the stick very very heavily against the driver. And, and you know the, we've got to recognise there are many many people that there are no other option to get to their work on time than to use their car. And you are you are just saying you're going to make it increasingly difficult for that to happen. You're you're, you're really. You really are, uh, you know, using uh, all the powers that there are. You're going to charge them if they park on, uh, use the, 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 the parking on their, uh, within their, their uh, workplace. And if they decide to park on the street, you're going to stop them doing that as well. So you're really just saying, you know, two fingers up to, to anybody that's driving their car. Um, I'm not sure that's an expression that I'm <laughs> going to allow in well, the committee. Uh, uh, well, Alexander, I draw that expression. Drive a car. Alexander, I, have, I, have... I think you understood the basics of, the, yes. of that question. 
I, 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 I drive a car, I cycle, I walk. I think most people in this room will use public transport, cycle, walk, drive at different times as well. I'm, I have no interest in upsetting or offending any group of travellers. But um, I th I'm not trying to talk in absolutes. I'm saying if that there is problematic displacement, if there is an overspill of cars that is blocking carriageways or making pavements dangerous for people walking along them, then yes, local authorities have a suite of tools available to them. I'm not trying to imply that local authorities will be painting the yellow lines on every street as soon as a workplace parking levy comes into effect. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking in these terms. Can I just add that I used to work at Nottingham. I led on the development of the levy there. And um, what Nottingham found was that um, many, there were already controls in many places. So there, there were already issues. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't directly related to the workplace parking levy. There were already issues that needed managing. Richard, very briefly. Yeah, OK, uh, Sue Flack, you, you worked in Nottingham. So why is it, you know, the hundreds of councils in England, more than what there is in Scotland, why is it only Nottingham have brought in this parking levy? I, I, now, I now work, as well as helping transform Scotland, I now work as a, as a consultant advising other authorities on workplace parking levy, and I can, I can give you lots of names of authorities that are now progressing workplace parking levy. They haven't... They, they, they waited a while. They wanted to wait to see what happened in Nottingham, I think, and to see whether um, there were longer-term implications of what Nottingham had done, so they waited a good five years. But there now are a number of authorities... I can tell you some of them, if you like. Um, Reading, yeah. Reading, Birmingham, Leicester, um, Oxford and Cambridge. Um, TfL is, is providing a supportive environment for the London boroughs. And the one, the one leading in uh, London is Hounslow. Also Sutton and Merton and Camden uh, have, have started preparing. Um, th those are all the ones that have actually done something, committed money. Um, there are lots of others that are talking about it but haven't actually committed any money um, and prefer to keep their proposals secret. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my question is, 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 well, the next question is me, is, is, is that we heard in the last evidence session that this was going to place a large financial burden on businesses um, and they were really concerned that some of the smaller businesses uh, which actually have very low margins and have no access because of their remote locations to public transport will, will face a huge financial burden. Um, Stuart, would you like to... Is that wrong? Well, I think it's up to the... That's the joy of the legislation, and it's up to the local authorities to look at where this piece of... Uh, the, where the work... where the WPL would have greatest impact and where it would not, it doesn't have to do it. Where it can, uh, you know, th those those uh, businesses that are really remote require people absolutely to drive to. You would suspect would not come under uh, the guise of the, the legislation because um, local authorities would would make smart decisions about where to apply it and where not to. So so. Sorry, so where one of those small businesses is, 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 is in an area that you just draw the line around it and, and take it out, out with the area. So if it was on the edge of Aberdeen, you just draw the line inside it so, so it doesn't affect them. And again, it goes back to what are you trying to resolve? Are you using the workplace parking levy to reduce congestion? Are you using it to try and uh, reduce pollution? Uh, and you need to determine which parts of the geography of your city are most affected. OK. Alexander, do you want to...? Um, the first thing I'd say is I wouldn't necessarily recommend a workplace parking levy as an effective policy in a rural area. I think it is something that the benefits are likely to be seen, much more likely to be seen in urban areas with a critical mass of congestion. Um, for businesses in those areas with, with margins. I'm, I'm not an expert enough to talk about the business mechanisms, but I think it is absolutely the case that there are externalities to car travel that are not at the moment being properly picked up, uh, such as air quality uh, through carbon emissions. And I think a workplace parking levy is actually a, f a fairly small mechanism to rebalance this. OK, and Sue, so maybe, maybe in that you could... I mean, what they also said, is, we also heard, was that unless it was actually paid by the driver of the car, it wouldn't change anyone's opinion. Do you, do you, 
Subit. I think what they were saying earlier on misses out one stage, which is that the employer... I, I disagree in the sense that the employer has a role in uh, managing um, car travel of their commuters, in managing the travel of their commuters. So I don't think it is an either-or. Either the employer pays and nothing happens in terms of... Um, change of mode or the employee pays it and there's consequently a mode a mode change what happens what happened in nottingham was employers acted to reduce their parking because they acted to reduce their liability so they took on some of that responsibility of managing their employees car travel they basically did travel plans we'd already done a lot of travel planning before the levy came in so they were used to the process but as um as Alex said, um, there's an officer whose job it is to go around and advise on travel planning and managing parking. And so they, there was, employers also have a role in reducing their liability. They, they, I think the, even the people here would, would have said that. Um, and by doing that, they can, they can help understand how employees need to get to work and therefore they can talk to the local council about how to improve those alternatives. So it's, it's like a, a circular mechanism. OK. Pauline, you wanted to come in. Did, Pauline, did you want, did yes, you want to come in? Uh, yeah. Um, so what interests me in all of this, um, from what you're seeing, is to get the modal shift. Although there's a choice between applying it, local authorities applying it to the employer, to get the modal shift, you would have to really apply it to the, the worker, I think. However, um, I mean, IRA, for instance, that uh, Transport Scotland's own figures show that um, of the to two lowest income groups, 50% of the lowest paid in Scotland use their car to get to work. And you, would you be concerned that uh, applying it to workers are actually going to penalise the lowest paid workers who are already trying to manage? Many families are struggling. There's plenty of evidence of this. And a £400 a year charge is possibly going to actually uh, lead to people losing their jobs because they can't afford to get to work. Does that concern you? It depends on what the charge actually is. And the, the amendment does allow the promoting authority to decide what the charge is. It doesn't have to be £400. It can be another figure. Secondly, the charge is for the employer. The, the liable person is the employer, not the employee. And the employer doesn't have to pass it on to the employee in the same form. So, so can I just stop you there? So is it your view that it shouldn't be passed on then? No, it's, I think it's up to the employer whether it's No, is it your view that it should be passed on or not? I, it, the, I, I'm just following what the legislation says. And, and the, yeah, I know the, what the legislation says, but you represent organisations that are arguing for a modal shift. Is it, do it, you not have any concerns about low-paid workers and all of this? I do Would have, you be I happy do have, if I do have, I do have concerns, and you didn't let me finish, which was that employers can pass the levy on. It doesn't have to be in the same form. They can charge lower paid workers less or nothing, and they can charge higher paid workers more. And that's what Nottingham City Council does. OK. I, I, and I think, in fairness, uh, Pauline, that's as close to the answer to the question you will perhaps get on that. Stuart, I'd like to... Could you ask, bring you in at this stage, please? Uh, yes, I've got a wee supplementary before I start, and it is we. Just to Alexander Quetta, um, there is already, of course, a charge that's differential for different vehicles. Uh, I pay £10 a year in road fund tax for my little hybrid car. Um, if I had a Range Rover, um, I would be paying £450 per year. So there is a mechanism already for discouraging people from having large uh, emissions footprints. Is, is that a better or worse way of dealing with this than introducing an entirely new tax and all the things that come with it? Um, yeah, in principle, I have no objection to the idea of, of some stepped way of implementing this tax so that people on lower income were, were paying less. Um, with regard to whether people are already paying enough because of road tax. I mean, since 1997, the cost of motoring is down 10% in real terms. Mm -hmm. Bus fares are up 7%, uh, rail is up 5%. 
Uh, last year, the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer said since 2010 that holding back fuel duty has saved the average motorist £850 and the average van driver over £2,000. Since the same time, the average train season ticket has gone up £694. So we, the point is that the least socially desirable modes of transport right now are being prioritised in a flat way, regardless of your capacity to afford them or not. There is no means-tested train ticket if you have to get the train to work. Um, I think this is a relatively small financial mechanism that can rebalance that. Okay. Um, now, let me move to my substantive question, Camina. Um, that uh, one of the parts of the discussion around this is the uh, is relieving potential burden that it might transfer from uh, the company or the employer paying this tax down to workers. Um, health service workers have been uh, identified, and indeed the previous panel, um, th there was a case made that you end up exempting everybody because there's a case you could make for virtually everybody. Um, so how should such exemptions be operated, especially given that the, uh, the workplace parking levy is a levy on the employer? How, how do you end up doing it? Now, I know that Nottingham have done some things in this and we had evidence, uh, but, but how could you make an exemption system work that makes any sense? If you'd like to go on that. It, Sue. I, well, I, if I was personally doing a workplace parking levy and I, and I was God and, and in that working workplace parking levy, I would only exempt operationally necessary um, uh, vehicles, which, are, which I think is a, a, a blip in the legislation. And your people earlier on didn't mention that, but in Nottingham it was a really big thing that um, fleet vehicles, suppliers... Um, people calling to fix it. You said they, in those days used to be to fix the photocopier, and these days it'd be an IT contractor or something. Those sorts of people who just come occasionally to park. That is exempted in Nottingham, and I would exempt that. I would also exempt blue badge holders. I, personally, I wouldn't exempt NHS, social workers, teachers, or anybody else. But do, do forgive me. You, you, you've said exempt vehicles, but this is a charge on employers. It's not a charge on vehicles. It's not a charge on workers, although it might end up being passed on. I accept that. And the example you gave of vehicles that are going to serve as photocopiers, the only parking levy that could apply to them is when they're at their base, um, I presume. So I'm, I'm really... I'm, because I don't think that there's a workplace parking levy associated with providing a space for for someone there? Or, yes, there or is, is it? There is. It's, All right, it's okay. in your amendment. It's the same as in the England and Wales and the London legislation. But and it, it, you, the, in, in the legislation, it's charging for the, the, the space used by those vehicles while, while those vehicles are using it. And just, and just by the way, the, the guy who was sat here talking about social workers, mm. um, if social workers are out all day, then they won't be charged because it's, it's the... The charge only applies when the space is occupied by a car. Sorry, 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 can, I just under, sorry Stuart, can I just understand that? So you've got a, 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 somebody in and out of the office all day <coughs> in a car and it's only charged when they're using it. Who's going to record when they're in and out of the office? The employer has to do some work. So, so you've got 900 employees and you're not sure who's in and out. There's somebody on the car park recording who's in which space. You can use technology. Um, you could, you, what okay. happens in Nottingham is that you declare how many spaces are required um, and then those spaces are basically shared by the people who um, work there. If you've got a lot of social workers or you've got a lot of people who are out at different sites, you declare a, max, a smaller maximum number of sites, of, of parking spaces that are liable for the levy and then people share as they come in and out. OK. John. No, I think John. Be Sorry. OK, John. I'm grateful for, Mr. Mark. for, for, for that um, description of, of a version of it. It's, it's not the version that's covered in okay. the amendment. So, thank you. OK. John. OK. Um, John, yours is the next question. So. Oh, yeah, right. Um, thank you very much indeed. Well, <laughs> thank you, Commissioner, and, and good morning, panel. Oh, I wanted to maybe just, b before asking this question, just to pick up on a, a point that Mr Quayle made, and it's, it's in respect of evidence that we heard uh, from Mr Douglas, and it's about the relative costs that have been going on. And um, 
If I may quote here, for example, UK public policy has seen fuel duty remain constant for the last nine years, costing the UK Treasury approximately ten billion a year. Ten billion a year. And uh, for avoidance of doubt, that comes from the RAC Foundation. Um, would either of you like to comment on that, Mr. Douglas? And when, when we're talking about the costs of things, that does seem to be a significant. And if we were going to uh, use the Barnett formula, there's. Uh, Sorry, a, John, I'm, I'm totally confused. Is, is fuel duty as part of the working place parking levy? We are talking about the relative costs of different modes. That's what the witnesses were talking about a minute ago. I'm adding to that by evidence we've got from one of the witnesses, Convener. That's right. why I'm mentioning it. Okay. Well, let's. I gave you my statistics a moment ago that um, it is quite evident that the trend for however long you measure it, um, for the last 10, 20, 40 years, has been to make motoring cheaper, has been for public transport to get more expensive. Um, that is, that's, that's especially important that that is considered right now when we know that we need to be tackling air quality and congestion, which is a major cost to the biggest cities in Scotland. We also know that... Um, Earlier this month, the First Minister declared a climate emergency as well. And making motoring cheaper, continuing to make it cheaper, is something that will only encourage more people to drive. Mr Douglas. Yeah, yeah and at the same time as fuel duty has remained static, uh, the car ownership has continued to increase and increase and increase. Um, so what do you get? More congestion, more congestion. Uh, this slows up. It affects negatively on business. It impacts on public transport because buses become snarled up in the congestion. They become less reliable. Less people use them. So bus services become less. So more people drive. So the roads become more congested. It's a vicious downward cycle because of... Because, and the, the cheaper you make car driving, the, the, the greater that cycle becomes. OK, uh, thank you. C can I ask about a response that we've received to the, the, the survey we had? Quite a number of folks said that, um, that travel infrastructure should be improved before the work parking uh, levy is introduced, um, thereby giving workers a viable alternative. Now, the creation and publication of a, a local transport strategy will be a prerequisite for any local authority looking to implement a WPO. Can you comment on the relationship between these, the strategy and the implementation, please? Who'd like to go on that? Sue. The, <laughs> the linking of workplace parking levy to the strategy is really, really important, and also the linking of the funding that workplace parking levy to bring to the implementation of that strategy is really, really important for various reasons. One is that there's no point in doing a workplace parking levy unless you've got stuff to spend it on that is going to be things that are going to be useful for people. Um, so the, the, the two, it's really important to link them together. And then I think that, it sh that consultation should be done on the basis of the package of the local transport strategy. And in terms of implementation, um, there, what, what Nottingham did was borrow, from, in effect, borrow from the flow of workplace parking level revenue to um, be able to implement early public transport improvements. So lots of people said that they would like to have the public transport improvements first before the levy started. So the, the sort of promise was made that things would be delivered quickly, and they were in fact delivered within three years of the workplace, and that includes the tram. So that was pretty good, pretty good going within three years of, of the levy coming in. I think it's unfair to people who are paying the levy um, to not have the promised alternatives there and what Nottingham also did was keep the levy low for the first three years to reflect the fact that those alternatives weren't there um, until they came in on the on just about on the third year. Okay, thank you. Um, um, yeah, a workplace parking levy should be one aspect of a basket of measures that you're implementing at the same time, improving bus services, better public transport all round. Um, and better provision for active travel and helping workplaces. So having that within the context of a local travel plan, um, I think, is, is, a, is a strength of, of the bill, of the amendment. Um, it's, it's, we talk about it as a revenue, or having the potential for revenue raising, but because that is ring-fenced, we can already talk about that as being money for investment already, and you already be looking at that shopping list of what is going to give people who do drive to work an alternative, a cheaper, more affordable alternative to get to work. 
And the point I would make is that well, we are actually investing, the Scottish Government is investing significantly in infrastructure. There's been great investment in the, in the rail infrastructure just recently. We know Sustrans, uh, through working through its uh, local authorities, is, is delivering uh, substantial uh, improved cycleways throughout the country, so, so there is. One of the findings from the Smart Choices, Smarter Places programme that I run, which is also funded uh, through Transport Scotland, is that actually people don't know uh, about infrastructure. We had a, a project in Edinburgh, a workplace project in Edinburgh, that by working with, lo with local community or with local employers, we increased the awareness of the quiet routes in, in, in Edinburgh by over 27%. Uh, people don't know about the infrastructure that exists, and, and there's a whole host of other projects that we've been running that have demonstrated that as well. So whilst I accept that infrastructure needs to improve, I would also suggest it is improving and that a bit of knowledge would help people's understanding of that as well. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Maureen, uh, you've got thank the next you, question. Good morning, panel. Um, as you know, workplace uh, car park spaces are already subject to domestic rates, sorry, to non-domestic rates. So do you consider it's fair that they're going to be then subject to uh, an additional tax uh, through the working place parking levy? limited way. I'm, I'm not familiar with um, the non-domestic rates or the, the system of charging. Um, I, would, I think it's certainly true, however, that the cost of motoring is not being accounted for with externalities through carbon emissions and air quality. Sue, so, do you want to... The difference between workplace parking levy and, and business rates is that the workplace parking levy money, is a, it's a, because it's a levy, it is um, entirely ring-fenced for transport purposes. So the levy is it is an addition to business rates, obviously, but it is a, a transport levy, if you like, um, whereas business rates is, is used for other purposes. Um, so I do think it's fair, for the reasons that Alex just said, that because the business rates are not intended to cover the, the costs to the community of car travel and the costs of the parking space, in effect, then I, that, I think that's fair to, to, to have a, another charge that's aimed at that purpose. Okay. Uh, I can add, there's no such thing as free car parking. It costs, the creation of car parks cost money. You know, the infrastructure that goes underneath, the more infrastructure you need to get to your, the buildings, you know, you've got more pipes, more, more cabling, all of that extra cost. Car parks create more flooding, so your waste water, uh, your water uh, pipes need to be bigger and fatter and longer to deal with all of that fl uh, uh, runoff water. So there's all those additional costs that having these big lumps of car, uh, tarmac and concrete need to meet. And then there's the opportunity cost. Because we've got, you know, we heard earlier of, of you know, 1,200 space car parks at a business, how many other opportunities could be, that land be used for? So there's a whole opportunity cost. Now, cars sitting on a piece of tar is not a really good use of land. And so they just sit there. Okay. Maureen, have you... It's fine, thank you. Okay. Um, Jamie. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that last comment. I think the fact that there are people who use those cars to get to their place of work and earn a decent living is a valid reason for them to use the parking place outside of it. But the non-car users have to pay for that because the cost of the car park infrastructure gets taken up, absorbed by the business and passed on to customers, to those who buy their services. Everybody has to pay for it because people choose to drive. Yeah. Sorry, just, just so I could clarify something, is, is that when businesses are, go, for, you get planning permission for a business. In the past, it was always demanded you had X amount of parking spaces relevant to the office space or the business place that you're using. <laughs> So it was a stipulation, a government stipulation, that if you were putting in an office like, say, Aviva were putting in, you had to provide X amount of car parking spaces, which 
therefore was a requirement. So what you're saying is you think that that should be ignored, that it was a government demand put in those spaces, and it's right to then uh, tax the business on those spaces. And, and just uh, as an aside, as, as far as the extra equipment goes, some of these, I would have to say, just as an observation, some of the car parking spaces may be underneath businesses which don't take up or use any more land. I accept that last point, although the construction costs of the bit that you need to support the building on top of the um, but I, and I accept the point about planning. However, we have a climate emergency. Transport is the biggest cause of emissions in this country. 60% of those emissions come from the private car. We cannot accept the status quo. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, uh, Pauline, in, fa in fairness, sorry, yeah, I, I'm, I don't mean to be difficult. I'm trying to let this committee run to allow people to, to express their views. And uh, you're very welcome to the committee. You're, you're not welcome to actually challenge the way I run the meeting. So, I, 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 Stuart, I've heard that point. John, you wanted to ask That's a question, question. Uh, and then I'm coming back to Jamie. John had a supplementary to that. No, I, I didn't. Sorry, oh, I misunderstood. Sorry, I've misunderstood. You. Jamie, you want to ask so, a Thank question. you, convener. Um, Okay, let, let's bring it back to the point of the levy. Um, Mr. Stevenson talked about some of the uh, incremental costs that could be applied to drivers if they choose to drive vehicles which are less environmentally friendly than others. And there are a number of ways in which government is able to do that through the introduction of punitive measures through low emission zones. You have to drive a certain type of car, increase road tax. Uh, in some local council areas, they have increased charges for residence permits, for example, based on categorisation. Uh, and all of that is down to consumer choice, whether they choose to drive this type of car over that type of car. But the point here is about whether that choice exists for many people to get to their place of work. And for many, as we've heard in previous panels, from people who I respect, uh, represent a wide range of organisations, not just the private sector, that many people simply need to drive to work. So where there is choice, where there is no choice, why should uh, those people who have no choice have to pay the levy? Sue, do you want to lead off on that? Um, I, sh I, think, I think I understand your point. Um, on the, on the point about the vehicles, it would be possible, the legislation is very flexible, it would be possible to say exempt or to give a 100% discount to electric vehicles. So you could do that same differentiation that you were talking about in terms of the different types of vehicles. Um, in terms of the thing about people have literally no other choice um, to get to, to work by car, I repeat my point that the charge is to the employer, not to the employee, and the employer could um, change the way that they charge on, take the charge on to employees to say that those people who live in um, places that are very, very, very isolated or very, very difficult to access public transport, they could say, well, we're going to do something special for you because we recognise that that's an, that's an issue for this set of employees. But it's worth remembering that if they do that and they still want to charge the levy on, then they're going to charge some other people a higher amount. So they have to, it obviously has to be balanced up. But, 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 sorry, but, so but the employer can, has a role, is what I'm trying to well, say. Well, the but this is what I don't understand, mediate. because this comes back to earlier line of questioning, that uh, Sustrans in their submission said that the, uh, the levy acts as an incentive to leave the car at home and travel by alternative means. Well, how can it be an incentive if it's the employer that pays for it? So surely you're saying that the cost must be passed on to the employee, or there is no incentive, therefore there is no modal shift, therefore what's the point of the levy? But there's another action, which is employer action, which, as I said, is about reducing the amount of parking on site. So um, one, one reaction that employers can do, it's a perfectly reasonable one, is they can say, we're, we're not going to have any car parking on site anymore. And that, therefore, they are forcing employees to look at the way they travel, and some of those, some of those employees will travel by a different mode. It's, I wouldn't recommend it. It's not, I don't recommend that. <laughs> but, you know, that is a reaction that could be, could be done. Alexander, do you want to answer? Yes, I think there's, there's two bits I need to answer with that. Um, the first part is whether it's paid by the employer or by the employee. Um, and it's, it, it's one or the other in different measures. And I, I think that's to be embraced about the policy. That so what's you can, your view on this? Um, Who should pay it? Sustainable Scotland view is that that very much depends on 
the local authority, and they can set the charge and the area on it, determining what they would like the ratio of that to be, or to attempt to get close to that ratio. I think that it's the benefit both that the employer pays it, because it raises revenue, or if it is passed on to staff, it still may raise revenue, but it may also encourage um, modal shift. So I, I think we have to hold those two, those two, two things in our heads at the same time, that they are both positive outcomes of this policy. The second thing to say, referring to the SUSTRANS submission, I'm looking at this in the widest possible sense, that it will, it is, it is likely to have a positive impact for people on lowest incomes, who are less likely to own a car, car ownership rises as income rises, and whilst I perfectly accept that there will be people in the position that you talk about, the benefits are more likely to accrue to people who are on lower incomes, who are less likely to own a car, they're more likely to live in areas uh, that suffer from air pollution, and I must take issue with some of the evidence from the last session. There is pages and pages of studies that can tell you that air pollution is worse in areas of higher deprivation. And also road casualties are significantly worse in areas of high deprivation. So if we can reduce the amount of vehicles that are travelling into our towns and cities by this method, there are absolutely significant benefits that will accrue to um, low-income people. So by that, by that logic, then, you accept that there are people on low incomes who have to drive, regardless of what type of vehicle they drive, to get to their place of work, including many of the public service workers we discussed in the last panel, uh, including many on, on low incomes. Um, and you're, you're saying to this committee that this will have a beneficial effect on them. I'm saying that overall, the impact of this policy is likely to have a beneficial effect but I fully accept that there will be people disadvantaged by this policy and it is incumbent on local authorities to ensure that their assessments of it mean that they introduce it in a way where those impacts are mitigated. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to offer Colin the opportunity to come in on, on this point because I, I, you raised some concerns that this might be an area you want to talk about. I, I, mean, I think the first point is I'm not clear whether or not the panel, I mean, we've been asked several times, actually think this should be passed on to the employee. I mean, I, don't, I mean, you only have a view on that. I mean, what is your view? Or should we just ban it being passed on to the employee then? Because you don't think it should be? My, my view is it's up to the employer. So they should have that opportunity to pass that on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Alexander. Um, I concur it should be up to the employer to choose, and there are benefits both if the employer pays it and if it is passed on to the employee. Stuart. Yeah, I think I'd agree with, uh, with Alex. There are, there are significant benefits to be gained for everybody. Okay. Can, can I just pursue the issue around um, whether or not this is progressive then? Because both such strands and password all say it is a progressive measure, and you argue it's because um, some people on, on the lowest incomes don't um, have a car. Well, what's progressive about uh, an amendment that says the chief executive of a health board earning £100,000 a year is exempt, but a carer on the living wage isn't exempt? What is progressive about that? Doesn't sound very progressive to me. Um, the, the legislation is very flexible. There's, there's scope to do all sorts of different things. I mean, as you know, there's scope to exempt different types of people. There's the, there's the scope to um, charge only at certain times. So if you're talking about shift workers, there's ways of, of, of looking at how shift workers fit in and how part-time workers fit in. There, there, it, it's. I think my argument on this is that it's down to the local authority and to, to work with the employers to work out what are these sorts of issues. And if they are issues, that there are ways within the legislation to resolve them or at least to mitigate them. Um, I agree with Alex that overall, um, the, the money raised from the workplace parking area, if it's spent on public and active transport, then that's overall, that's a benefit to lower paid people. And TfL, um, Transport for London, um, just, just say that. They just say that anything spent on public transport, walking and cycling, benefits low-paid people, full stop. Alexander, do you want to...? Um, yeah, I'd reiterate again that in the round overall, I'm talking about it having progressive impacts. I think whilst it does depend on how it's implemented, I think that's much more likely. The example that you bring up, of course, is unfair, and I would have no qualms with changes to the bill that made the executive on £100,000 a year liable for that cost, um, I, I think that there are things that you can do within it that can mitigate those concerns. Colin. I just, I just pursuing that particular point, though, the bill does not state that there should be a payment made on the ability to pay. 
And you've just simply said it should be left to, to effectively local authorities, it should be left to employers. We've seen it in Nottingham that it's often passed on. Some employers, the council, for example, uh, have a, an ability to pay a mechanism, but a lot of them don't. So surely we need to have a duty in the legislation that makes it clear, if we are interested in being progressive, that any payment made by an employee must be based on ability to pay. Surely that's a basic principle that should happen in this legislation. It shouldn't just be left to the whim of, of, of maybe what a local council might want or what an employer might want. Surely we should set that in legislation. That's a basic principle that should exist. Yeah, I, I, think, I think my answer then was, was unclear before. I, I wasn't implying that that was in the bill, but if the committee was minded to recommend that, Sustrans Scotland would not object to that or suggest it is a bad idea. Sue, do you want to add anything to that? I, I'm not a lawyer. I, um, I'm, I'm just not sure how you could actually do that within the law, but if there was a way... Okay. Uh, Stuart, do you want... Oh, I just, it, it sounds okay. as though it would be quite tricky, but... Okay. Principally... <laughs> I the panel to know that the word rural doesn't actually feature in any of your evidence to the committee on this particular issue. We've got an economic system that, that drives jobs into congested cities. I mean, two of the organisations here have offices in, in probably one of the most congested parts of, of Scotland, um, and, and we, we drive people towards having to work in cities. Um, but the reality is not everybody who works in a city lives in that particular city. And in your evidence, each of you argue that the people best placed to, to design the workplace levy is an individual local authority. Can you tell me why Edinburgh City Council are best placed to devise a workplace parking levy that impacts on my constituents in the borders who have no choice, partly because housing costs are so expensive in Edinburgh, many of them don't live in Edinburgh. How, does that, how are they best placed to design a workplace parking levy that impacts on my constituents in the borders, Midlothians and elsewhere, who have to drive into Edinburgh, because that's where the jobs are, they will have to pay this levy, but not a single penny from that levy will go and improve in public transport in their area, and often they have to drive from a rural area Colin. because there is no public transport. Colin, uh, sorry, that, that was a very, very long question, um, and I, I think we got the gist of it, and, and maybe I could drive the panel to a, to a short answer uh, to that. Sue, perhaps you'd like to start with um, the There's nothing to stop Edinburgh City Council or whichever council it is spending some of the workplace parking levy money outside their areas. Nottingham spent uh, two-thirds of Nottingham's tram lines are outside of Nottingham's city council area, so two-thirds, sort of, you know, very roughly speaking, two-thirds of the levy money is spent outside the city council area. So there's, no, there's nothing to stop that. Um, it, obviously, the city, Edinburgh City Council should be working with those councils all around to, you know, to, to make sure that what they are proposing to spend the levy on is relevant to commuters. I th the, the, the amendment does have a provision in it for an economic or for impact studies to be done, and I think that you know that that is quite important. That that Edinburgh would have to do an impact study, and that would have to go wider than just the city council, um, and would have to show what mitigations there are for people who live outside the city council area. I, I, I think. Alexander. Um, only to say that. Of course, there's a significant rural population that do contribute to these cities, and I think for that reason, uh, park and ride, ensuring that affordable park and ride is available around uh, cities that have workplace parking levy, will be very valuable. Stuart, are you? Yeah, and it's the cities that are having to deal with the congestion, the pollution that are being caused by the commuters <coughs> coming in, so it's right that they... No have to travel to Edinburgh because that's where the jobs are, that's where your offices Colin, are in the Colin. city of Edinburgh, so it's the computer's fault. Is that the, is that the issue? No, I, I think that's, a, I think that's a, a little bit unfair, Colin, and I, and I think you've had a fair crack of the whip, and I think you've made your point. And, and I'm going to move to the next question, which is Mike Rumley's mic. Thank you, convener. Reducing congestion and reducing air pollution. Now, the evidence we received from Nottingham when we received it by video uh, they said that actually they hadn't reduced congestion. Um, they think anecdotally that it had reduced the increase in congestion. They hadn't reduced congestion. And they, when questioned, uh, question, questioned them, they said they had, didn't have any evidence that it had reduced air pollution either because they hadn't measured that. So the evidence from Nottingham <laughs> is that. Now, seven years 
after they've implemented their workplace parking levy, they stand alone in all the hundreds of councils across England and Wales that have done this. And their firm advice to us as a committee and to say to, count to councils was, there are three ways of tackling this. You go for low emission zones, you go for road charging, or you go for workplace parking. And their strong advice was, go for one of these. Do not do more than one. The Scottish Government in the Transport Bill has gone down the route of low emission zones. And with John Finney's amendment, his amendment now goes down the route of workplace parking. So do you disagree with the evidence that we've received from Nottingham? Uh, I assume you do. Do you, do you disagree with that and could you tell us why? And do you think if John Finney's amendment is successful, then we will have this dual approach which Nottingham strongly advises us not to proceed with. Yep, Sue. Just forget Nottingham for the moment. No, I don't I, want to forget Nottingham. I would, I would argue Nottingham. with you I'm on virtually everything on. that you said. But, no, you know, I, so please, please. That. Let's talk about Birmingham. No, no, no please. Birmingham, no, Birmingham are proposing to My do both the clean air zone. Sue, Sue sorry. I, I, I'm going to let you talk, talk briefly about Birmingham, but, but the... the Mike did actually ask you about Nottingham, and I think you okay. need to address the issues there as well. OK. Nottingham has got a low emission zone and workplace parking levy. It has got both of those things. So um, what I think they might have been talking about was the clean air zone. And the clean air zone charges um, uh, very polluting vehicles. And what has happened is that Nottingham has convinced the government that it doesn't need a clean air zone, because, partly because of the workplace parking levy. So it's managed to show, through demonstrating that the, the, the work that is already being done Lots of things, uh, work, workplace parking levy is only one part of it. Lots of things put together have meant that they don't need to do a clean air zone. Therefore, that means they don't need to charge heavily po polluting vehicles, partly because they haven't got very many, because they've done a lot of work with buses, taxis and fleet vehicles in, in the city centre, which is where the, the pollution is highest. Well, uh, what I was going to say about Birmingham is they are proposing both a clean air zone and a workplace parking levy at the same time, because they see that those things mesh very closely together because the workplace parking levy is about commuters and the, the clean air zone is about, is about hi, highly polluting vehicles, many of which are not commuters. They are, they are mostly um, heavier vehicles in Birmingham. I don't think it does depend on you know, where, where, which is the location that you're talking about. Um, but there, I think there is the, the potential to do more than one. London are doing more than one in various places that they've got... A, choice of three uh, or more they've got choice of four actually and um, so they are they are there are going to be a series of different charges in London um, so it is possible to do more than one <coughs> I, I don't think it's something that Scotland really needs to worry too much about at the moment because um, there there are you know why you, you're interested in introducing a new idea so I think you know you should be focusing on introducing that new idea rather than worrying about one on top of another could I just follow that up by saying, so you disagree fundamentally with the evidence that we received last week from Nottingham. They said, and I'll repeat it, because we're talking in this bill about low emission zones, and that's what Nottingham talked to us about. This bill gives authority to councils to create low emission zones. It also, and the amendment facing us to which we're taking evidence today is about to give local authorities the opportunity to implement workplace parking. The evidence, I repeat, that we received from Nottingham was if you have low, you can go for low emission zones, road charging or workplace parking, and their advice to us was don't do it. I'm still not, I don't still quite understand why you seem to disregard the evidence that Nottingham have given us the last week, but perhaps the other two members could contribute. Uh, Alexander, do you want to come in and then I'll come back to you soon? Yeah, and um, the first point, I agree with Sue that a low emission zone and workplace parking levy are complementary tools that work together. I, um, the, when Nottingham are pressed to decide which one is, is their preferred option, the situation in Scotland is slightly different in England. In England, what is being pursued for urban air quality tends to be clean air zones. So this is a pay-for-access system where the, the fee is set at a rate where you are charged to enter, but you can still enter. Low emission zones, as they're set up in the transport bill, should charge in a way that will be prohibitively expensive to bring uh, vehicles in. I think it's uh, 
a diesel vehicle from before 2015 or a petrol vehicle from about 2005 would be banned under what is proposed as the guidelines. So that's not an incentive in the same way. That is saying don't bring these vehicles into, uh, into, towns, into cities where there's low emission zones because the t tool of a low emission zone targets dangerous air pollution. Now, this is slightly different, in my view, to a workplace parking levy, which has as its, its primary objectives reducing congestion, encouraging modal shift, and revenue raising as well. Air quality is probably a likely benefit of it, but that is a, a, probably a second tier likely benefit of it. So I think in the Scotland specific context, a workplace parking levy and a low emission zone is much more likely to dovetail than um, a clean air zone and a workplace parking level might in England. Sue, do you want to come back? I, I, think, I think that's the answer. We're talking about two different animals. A low emission zone is something different in England to what it is in Scotland. So. Stuart, are you happy? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Much better equipped to me. <laughs> Jamie, do you want to, to come in on that? Thank you. I perhaps I'll just follow on from Mr Rumble's line of questioning. Um, uh, would, would you therefore support uh, a limitation on the introduction of workplace parking levies that it's only local authorities that have cities therein could introduce the levy? Because it doesn't seem to be any huge benefit other than being a financial uh, revenue generating tax in local authorities that do not have either congestion, air pollution problems uh, and are more likely to be uh, the sorts of local authorities that contain those out of city uh, business and industrial parks with large amounts of car parking space, where inherently there probably is more space anyway, and people need the car to get to those places of work. Yep, Sue. I, I, I agree. I think, I think I agree. The authority promoting workplace parking levy should have to show why they are promoting workplace parking levy, and if there are no congestion, pollution or other related um, problems, then th that they should not be promoting a workplace parking levy. It should be part of the tools to, to solve an identified issue. Alexander. I'm not in a position to tell a local authority that it's an inappropriate mechanism for, I don't think, but I agree with the sentiment within that, that the benefits are much more likely to be felt in larger urban areas with sort of critical mass of people and vehicles. Stuart, you want to... Yeah, well, whether that... In defining it as only applicable in a city doesn't necessarily the issues that Alex just talked about doesn't, doesn't always happen just in cities. So. Mm. So, so that raises an interesting point. I mean, it, it sh should it be the case then that if, there's no, if, the, if the local authority cannot demonstrate that such a levy would have a tangible benefit on either congestion uh, or air quality or whichever other uh, objective it had set itself, that it could not simply introduce the levy simply as a way of raising local taxation? I absolutely agree with that, um, but the package is the package. So the thing that you're looking at is what the levy is itself plus what it will, what it will buy. And if that is shown to not, not solve the issues that have been identified, then you know, there, there's, there's no reason for doing the levy. Thank you. That probably answers that question, which takes us to the uh, last question, which is from Richard Lyle. Richard. Before I ask my last question, can I ask Sue Flack, how long did it take um, Nottingham to introduce this and basically how long did they consult, did they consult with the local population, uh, how long did there was, was the consultation? Nottingham was the first, so it's not one that, it, it's, it doesn't mean that a, a place doing it now would take as long. We took about 10 years, ten years. Um, developing, developing the scheme, and con, um, the, the cons consultation was divided into two parts. Um, informal consultation, which was engagement with businesses, which we did for years and years, and then a formal consultation stage, which took the form of um, a properly comprehensive um, consultation documents um, uh, and an a, a inquiry, a public inquiry as well. Um, so public that inquiry. Public inquiry, yeah. Mm. That was a voluntary public inquiry. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so there were two. So the, the first informal stage lasted about six or seven years, and the second stage lasted about a year, which was like the proper formal stage. Well, we really came across the word the workplace parking levy about six months ago, just near the end of the year. Somewhere, it was a throwaway word that someone brought in at a, a committee, and I, I made a comment back on it. So would you be concerned about, uh, and you, you heard the, the panel earlier on, 
Concerns being raised that the workplace parking proposals have not been subject to any public consultation or assessment by the Scottish Government. What would be your view, since you're now te you're telling me there was a public inquiry and a 10-year consultation on this subject in, yeah. in Nottingham? I, w I, would, I wouldn't say that people have to that, that people have to do the same thing as Nottingham. It's because Nottingham was the first one that it was like that. Um, I think that authorities promoting workplace parking have, have to do a lot of informal consultation, a lot of informal engagement with businesses, with employers, with trade unions, with, with people who might be affected. And they, that, that helps them develop the scheme. So um, it helps to, to inform what the charge should be, what the exemption should be, what the boundary is. All those issues should be developed through consultation with affected people. And then once, that's, once they've got a finalised idea of what the scheme could be, then it goes to a formal consultation to make sure that everybody uh, has their say. Um, on, on, with, the, with some degree of detail as to what the proposals actually are. The, the, this morning they said you, they couldn't comment without knowing what the charge was. They, they're sort of right, really. You, you, you need to know what is the proposed charge before so, you can understand so just, the economic impact. Sorry, just to finish off, because I know the convener's uh, looking at me. Um, you would, you, would you agree with me <laughs> that to make a good law, you really need to have good consultation? Uh, I would. Thank you. John, you wanted to ask a question. Thank you. I, I just want the panel's view on a previous report from this committee, um, convener, which is alluded to. And this, this committee said in paragraph 219 of its report, and I quote here, the committee is of the view that demand management measures such as low emission zones and workplace parking levies have potential to make significant emissions reductions contributions. It therefore calls on the Scottish Government to consider whether these measures should be afforded increased prominence in the final CCP climate change plan. What's your view of that at all, please? Alexander? Um, workplace parking levies are an idea that's been around for quite a while now. They have demonstrable positive impacts. Um, my view is that they're a fairly small measure, and I'm, I'm not sure that they are actually as controversial as the debate has been in, in Scotland. So I, I'm not too surprised to see them feature in, in previous reports of the committee. Stuart. Yeah, there, it's one of, of many actions that need to be taken, um, not only in terms of the climate change emergency we have, but also in terms of the obesity and air pollution issues this country is faced with. Um, we need to start somewhere. Thank you. Sue, very briefly. No, I agree with that. OK. OK, thank you very Perfect. much. I think that brings us to the end of our questions. So thank you very much for uh, giving evidence this morning. Um, and that concludes our part of the public business, and we're going to move into private sessions. So if I could ask uh, witnesses and uh, Pauline to leave as quickly as possible, I'd very appreciate it. There will be no break, committee members. Thank you. <laughs>